We gaming. Okay, let's do this so shit. It, it, that's the story about how I accidentally caused 9-11. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I wouldn't doubt it. I wouldn't doubt it. Press the unmute oh. button on your mic in VR chat, by the way. Oh, okay. There we go. There you go. Up. There you go. Yeah. Oh, my God. Okay. So the thing that we were talking about right before this started was that you guys have, like, songs in each branch. Because, oh, yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. you know what? Before we even talk about that, let's establish people. Like, what's going on here? So uh, I guess in the order that you appeared, Spigs, do you want to... Do you want to start? Oh, am I first? Am I yeah. first? Uh, hi, hello. I'm Spigs. I am the person that says volunteer militant. I, uh, in 2015, bought a plane ticket to go join the Syrian power vacuum under the YPG uh, to go fight ISIS on the ground level. I spent most of my time in a mudslit trench trying not to get bombed uh, by Blinksis. I'll throw it to you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm Blinksis. Uh, I was in the Air Force. I was a geospatial intelligence targeteer, and I destroyed ISIS from the air. And try go. not to bomb th this guy. Yeah, I really appreciate that. One of the questions I, I know I pegged you with, but I'd like another answer to because I don't really remember, is yeah. uh, like, how did you how did you distinguish between me and and ISIS? Because I didn't. When you're in the army, you have on your ACH or your action combat helmet a little IR sensor that says, "I'm I'm yeah. one of you. Don't bomb me." Uh, right. How do you know who to bomb and who to not bomb when there is no IR sensor on top of my head? That's the neat part. We didn't. No, <laughs> just in all seriousness. Um, so. We actually had like an LNO that kept track of like all ground forces to include uh, Kurdish forces, Syrian regime, Russians if they were on the ground, uh, and any like coalition members if they were on the ground in like some sort of support role. So we would always consult them first to be like, hey, we have a target in this area. What do you think? And they're like, cool, that's ISIS territory. Go for it. Sweet, sweet. Huh. So there was some communication, just probably not enough to be comfortable on your end. That's very true. I remember at one point having to repair these uh, these GPSs for the Kurds because they didn't know our language, and they'd hand me an American GPS, and I'm like, oh, let me go through the uh, settings, beep, boop, beep, boop, beep. and then they would go to their crazy van. It's like uh, in the game Command and Conquer uh, when the GLA had that little like freaking crazy van with a with a satellite on top that helped you see the enemy map. The Kurds had yeah. one of those. They had a crazy van that just went around oh, communicating like the blue all force the. Tracker. Yeah, exactly. It's the only van okay. they had with the Blue Force tracker. But it looked like the kind of free candy van you'd want to avoid. Uh, any hoopers, they, they needed all their GPS repaired. And I'm assuming they, hopefully, they communicated with you to not drop a bomb on my head. So that was, that was cool. Small world, small world. So where, that's pretty cool. When you know, you say that you you had intelligence. Was the don't bomb the Kurds and their supporters kind of like? Was it number one priority or was it kind of an afterthought? Like if you had a target that was really important right there and there were Kurds like a solid 30 feet eggs. away. If you had to scramble a few eggs to make an omelet, even if those <laughs> eggs were named Spigs, uh... it was an acceptable loss. I don't think, you know, I'll be 100% honest. I don't think there was ever a strike that was authorized that would put friendly forces in harm's way. Like mm, to nice. include like Kurdish forces or coalition forces. Um, or we would revert to a weapon that we would be allowed to use in close proximity to friendly forces. No, no, broken, no broken arrow scenario. No, no, nothing like that. I heard it's there's like, a oh. missile now that they put knives on, like actual oh, like big oh, yes. bladed katanas, yes. so you can hit an individual in a car and not hit the other occupants in the car. A That's sniper a missile? A there's a oh, sniper yeah. missile that just cuts That's... people like a Ginzu knife now. Holy shit. It doesn't even blow up. It's just there to just slice you. It's it's purely kinetic. Like, even if you're within a, a few feet of this missile, you are going to turn into Swiss cheese. Like, it, it'll, it'll just cut you right down the middle. That thing, It's right. an insane weapon. The motherfuckers made a gun on we a still end up. These like, levels of capabilities and we still end up losing wars. Like, so here's the crazy <laughs> thing. Like, me and Spigs could be, like, same distance talking to each other, and then he would just disappear. And I'd be like, where the hell did he go? I mean, you would hear it, too. And you'd hear the impact, and then there's just a crater and nothing left. Like, th those things were meant to, like, be very surgical. That is genuinely Mark. terrifying. You know what I was thinking about last night? This is kind of depressing. I've heard you both <laughs> talk about very vivid images of death, right? Like, I, very, as the kids say, some yikesy shit. And uh, <laughs> I I Deep, thought about last moments. night, like, even though I've heard it so vividly, I've heard it described so, mm -hmm. you know, de in such detailed terms, 
I just cannot process the idea of a human body being in multiple pieces. Like I just, am, oh, yeah. my brain oh. cannot think about that. I uh, I remember a guy in Syria that kind of got in trouble because he kept picking up a human. He had a human face with him for a little while. Ugh. Like that, he was a real it. good guy, and he was just kind of, he was a little bit messed up. But at one point, he picked up a human face and he petted it. And it was like did, uh, he, did he do like the, the door a little bit? Oh no, he face. didn't. He buried it respectfully. He didn't do the Hannibal Lecter kind of stuff. Okay. Well, <laughs> so good. he wasn't he wasn't too crazy, but. Yeah, just like just to think that a face could be separate from a body is yeah, I hear you. It's a little alien. It's a little weird. Yeah. Where's my mule? It's eh. it's just I I am so sheltered from the kind of shit that I hear about like weekly or daily on my channel that I feel like I feel like I might uh, actually benefit in my work from a little trauma and that doesn't mean i want it that means that i'd probably be able to do my work better if i could empathize and i'll, mm -hmm. I'll take i'll take the doing the work worse but yeah, like a definitely... little bit of perspective yeah as you, as like you walk. perspective that's a better word than trauma yeah. right there so i, was about to say, uh, I spent a lot of my time walking through blinks's work <laughs> like, i got <laughs> <laughs> I, I know, uh, friggin' in we were we were there at the same time. 2015 is when I was in yep. Syria, and 2015, yep. you said, was when you were in Syria. Oh, so we were there at the same time. 2015, 2016, yeah, what we were doing. 2015 to 16 in the mid in area. the summer area, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. And I, I got there in the spring and left before the winter, so there was at least a half year uh, like okay. worth of overlap. And okay. uh, yeah, I, I remember quite a lot of bodies like freaking it was a lot of burials mostly like you did the overwhelming majority of the work i just got shot at and shot at random things that were shooting at me but fucking 90 percent of the lifting was just airstrike 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 over again yeah and well y'all did crazy work I, I i believe like the majority of y'all provided good intel because if we're like if we know where y'all are fighting like oh they keep shooting at this one building okay they're probably you know the isis fighters are probably in this building friendly dudes are probably in this building Probably. Let's verify it. But once we verify it, let's get rid of that building. Basically, it's like, okay, they're pointing at it with tracers. You no, hear I that? You made a very good canary. <laughs> I, thanks. <laughs> this one time I was uh, I was observing a building with my binoculars on. And let me get my other hand here. My uh, The binoculars on. I'm like, okay, I think they're firing from this window. And all of a sudden, my binoculars are all orange and red. I'm like, what the hell? What, where did they go? What, am I going blind? What's going on here? And I pull my binoculars up, and I'm like, oh, oh, that is a two-story fireball. <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> but Jesus. I assumed it was you, so good good job. I, Thanks. I, I meant to ask, how far did you get into Syria? Like, when you cross, because I'm assuming you crossed mm -hmm. over the border, um, maybe around the Sinjar area, or west of Sinjar is where you crossed? I, I honestly got like super lost because it's like I'm not sitting here with a uh, with a nice app on G uh, on Google Maps telling me where the <laughs> heck I am. And every Turn town right I here. can't I can't pronounce any of these like friggin Kurdish towns. But mm -hmm. uh, it was definitely in between Raqqa and Kobani. So it's north of Raqqa in the northeastern sector, which was the Rojava Valley in 2015. Right, right. I don't think it was till 2016 that the, the YPG finally attacked Raqqa. So the the Tel Tamir Mountains and uh, the multitude of endless villages that happened then. Yeah. Oh, that, so, that, that area. Because Tel Tamir was like west mm -hmm. of Hasaka, I, I believe. If, 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 if memory serves me right, it was like west of Hasaka, but like northeast of Raqqa, like the city. Yeah. Well, I, I always okay. wanted to go to Raqqa, but they, they kind of held back for a long time. And I'm like, OK, yeah. well, I, I got to go home if we're not going to do anything. But it was definitely north of Raqqa. It would, did, did you remember? Like, I know it's been a long time. It's been like five, seven years. But do you remember doing anything north of Raqqa? Oh, yeah. Lots of stuff, um, especially like around the. Oh, God. And now I got to re recall these names. There was this one military garrison north of Raqqa. Actually, there's two military garrisons north of Raqqa, one that was directly north of the city. That was held by, I believe, the 17th Syrian Army Division. I think it was the 17th. And then, like, even further north, it was this place called, like, Ionissa. Mm -hmm. and I That's... don't remember the, like, the exact garrison name, but we did a lot of work around that area. Woo! I, uh, I did not intermix or fight any of uh, Assad's forces, if that's part of the, the Syrian army. 
Yeah, I I mean, I think they were all either executed or they got out of there. I know a lot of them in Raqqa were executed. Yeah, they, they were kind of surrounded. Like ISIS just swept on both the west western and eastern sides of Raqqa and just went north and encircled the entire city and started doing their stuff there. Yeah, I feel Pretty bad wild. for Assad's forces, honestly. Like, it's really weird. Like, all the villagers, like, when we liberated them, they hate, they just, dis- they declared how much they hated Assad's forces at the time. But yeah. I, I guarantee we probably did just as much damage as Assad's forces to their village that, uh, that anybody else did. Mm. Yeah, that pretty much. Whoopsie doodle. That's what we like to call in the military a whoopsie doodle. A whoopsie doodle. That is a whoopsie <clears throat> doopsie, a whoopsie moment. <laughs> Speaking of whoopsie doodles, what's like, there what's the biggest mistake that you made on the battlefield? Uh, you want to go first? Or do you want me to take this first? Uh, go for it. Yeah, I'm still okay. thinking. Okay, I, uh, I burnt down the mayor's house. I burnt down and drowned the mayor's house. I was uh, I was incredibly drunk, which I kind of am a little bit now, on something called Wild Horse, which is some sort of discount Middle Eastern alcohol, like whiskey of some sort. And I, uh, I end up wandering around no man's land for a while because I'm uh, drunk as a skunk and I'm smelly. I smell terrible. It's been about a month since I've bathed. And I know that in this dilapidated abandoned village that the only shower is probably the mayor's house. So I kick down the door and right in front of me, there's a man in a banana hammock, nothing else but a yellow banana hammock. And I'm like, oh, shit, is that ISIS? And he's like, he says in perfect English, uh, F ISIS, BG, BG Rojava. And I'm like, oh, I think this is one of ours. And uh, we get to being friends. And it turns out he's our new translator. And he leaves and I end up taking a shower. And if you know anything about uh, Syrian in the Middle East, how their water heater system works, they have a really weird diesel drip water heater. And so I uh, drunkenly turn the water heater on. I try to get a night. I get a nice. Sh- I do get a nice shower. And I'm like, oh, this is wonderful. Finally, I don't smell like balls. And uh, I get a shower. But unfortunately, I turn the drip on a little bit too hard. The diesel went up the stream and ignited and started burning Ooh. down the mayor's house. I'm like, oh, oh god! And I go outside and I grab the, like the the fire hose, uh, and I start like trying to trying to fight the fire that I caused, and Half half the mayor's house is on fire, and the other half uh, is is fine. And I'm like, oh, okay, I think I, I I I fought the fire successfully. I put the hose down, and in a drunken stupor, I walk away. And about a month or two later, when we came back through that village, it half that house was submerged in water because there's no there's no water utility people in a war zone. Nobody calls the water department or the utility department to come shut that off like they would in the states. So like the whole place turned kind of turned into a bog. So I uh, I burnt down half a man's house and sank the other. Half. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Your, your turn. Your turn. Oh my god. <laughs> um, I, I I don't think I did that crazy of an oopsie doopsie, but we did have this. Uh, we we had this one target. It was a so ISIS was very good at con- trying to conceal their activities, and so one of the things they would do is they would build these like berms underneath the bridges. So rather than traversing across the bridge where they're exposed, they would build these bridges or th- these uh, berms underneath the bridge and then use that as like a, like a, I don't know, a land connection between, you know, two separate areas that they operated in. And so our objective was to destroy the dirt berm that was underneath the bridge using bombs, which it, it, it sounds it sounds stupid, but I mean, we, we couldn't really say no because one, it is a, it's a low collateral object. No one was really using it because the bridge was kind of fucked anyways. And so we're like, all right, let's see what we can do. So we planned, I think initially it was like eight 2000 pound bombs on it to where we would punch through the bridge, get into the dirt and then detonate. And then we were hoping that the water would just kind of make the dirt flow away and get out of there and ac- accomplish the objective. Bit of a weird objective. Well, anyways, they ended up tripling the amount of bombs in the final planning and they added a bunch more points to it so all these bombs are hitting individual spots on the bridge because we didn't want to necessarily destroy the bridge completely or collapse the bridge we just wanted to get rid of the berm anyways the day of reckoning comes and they have a fully loaded b1 
just packed to the brim with 2000 pound bombs, just release everything it had on this one bridge. And they all had these delays and you could see the bombs punching through and whatnot. Well, we didn't know that. that, I don't know if you remember that scene in um, squid game to where they have that little like honey circle and they have to take like a needle and they have to cut around it without breaking it. Otherwise they end up dying. Well, we didn't know that the bridge would essentially do the same thing. We punched it with so many holes in this one spot that it ended up just collapsing anyways. And not only did it collapse, but it reinforced the dirt berm that was underneath the bridge. So we spent an entire B one worth of 2000 pound bombs just to fortify their position. Whoops. That was, that was, uh, that was probably one of the bigger oopsie doopsies we had. <laughs> Whoopsie doodle. How did uh, Whoopsie doopsie. how did the higher ups respond to that one? Because it sounds like they were the ones who made the choice to change up. It the was plan. their exactly. It, I mean, it was it was their idea. So they're just like, um, well, the bridge is destroyed, so they at least they can't use that. All right, next. <laughs> like, okay, cool. Well, not my help problem. Me rescue my help me rescue my career from this bad decision. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the <laughs> thing about military leadership is they're not they're never wrong, right? You can't be wrong if you're in charge of the guys oh, that can tell you wrong. you're wrong, right? God, I hate officers. So and it was usually much. the same leadership that would tell us to strike stupid shit. I mean, what I mean by what I mean by stupid shit is shit that would get people into a lot of trouble. Like, hey, you see that dam? We want you to strike it. Um, no, this is going to flood everybody downstream and potentially kill hundreds of thousands. Why, why, why do you want us to bomb a dam? Because ISIS is shooting from it. Uh, no, no, sir. I see. I, I don't know if you know this or not, but you know, bombs they they explode and. And, and dams, they're holding back water, and probably not a good idea. We're going to bomb the dam. It got to the point to where the major that worked with us straight up told one, I think it was a two-star general, told mm-hmm. him to fuck off and stop asking for stupid shit. That wow. major ended up getting out the same time that I did because he wasn't making, he, he couldn't make rank. Because, I mean, he told off a general. This, uh, this no. orphanage, I need you, I need you to bomb need- this orphanage. Only the well, cutest kids live there, but ISIS put their flag on it. So, <laughs> I mean, future <laughs> ISIS in that orphanage, yeah. bomb it. Dude, no, bomb them in advance, like minority. Dude, oh, do God. you know what? Uh, do you know what one of the it's wildest, so this is a little political, but um, the wild, one of the wildest uh, fucking like articles I have ever seen was Ben Shapiro in like during the, I think it was like 09 maybe wrote an article called no i don't care about in quotations civilian casualties in the middle east oh and he he basically no he literally a lot of that article was implying the same shit like their future isis or or their future it was all kind of at the time (laughs) yeah no that shit was wild dude well i mean so you have to listen to him (laughs) <laughs> if you're unaware his wife's a doctor <laughs> <laughs> uh, every every other yeah. sentence dude my wife's a doctor by the way it's like a vegan <laughs> walking into a bar <laughs> bt dub it's like you, you yeah. can't see that well i can't oh, okay i guess you can yeah jesus yeah. christ uh so uh, i i guess it's their fault of... for being brown and poor really oh yeah clearly. Yeah, everyone... <laughs> they were clearly. there in the first place they just they were in the way. Have you thought oh of being God. maybe born in a different zip code? <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Have you tried having different spawn coordinates? <laughs> Have you thought about not being underneath the bomb when it reaches in the, you? Yeah. In the character creation screen, I need you to go to the melanin content. I need you to make it more white. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just oh, my Jesus. Slide her down. For real. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, like, okay. So, Blynn, you... You've worked with a lot of UAVs at some point, right? Like you targeted, and I'm guessing some of those got hit by UAVs. So, oh yeah, you definitely were like unintentionally the butt of the joke for the drone strike meme. Like, oh, absolutely. Yeah. How do you feel about the fact that your entire area of work in the military is like considered the evil part of you know a, a lot of people think the whole thing is evil, but. I mean, I mean, it, it can be evil. It's it, it probably shouldn't be labeled as evil as more so as it, as it is impersonal. Whereas mm-hmm. it's like you have a dude that is thousands of miles away in a comfy AC, you know, conics box with a couple of controllers playing fucking Call of Duty, lobbing missiles at random people that they will never meet. 
yeah, I, I mean, I could see why people are are kind of um, sour about that whole thing. But at the same time, ISIS, they wanted that that valiant death. You know, they they wanted to be they wanted to go out with a bang. So, I mean, we just kind of expedited their request a little bit. Yeah, there was no honor to the death of being bopped by someone, no. like you said, playing Call of Duty in a bunker. Especially by a gay furry. Like, damn, that's got to <laughs> that's got to sting a little <laughs> I, I guess it kind of goes the other way, too. When you think of, like, both the Taliban and ISIS and all the Middle Easterners that we fought, they tended to use IEDs, VBIEDs, things of that nature. And it's like, can you imagine being, like, a special forces, Q course correcting, uh, BUDS graduate that really spent oh, a lot yeah. of time being the greatest warrior ever, and then you just drive around and all of a sudden, boop, you're dead. Like, it's the same thing. Yeah, like, they're, yeah. they have their tactics and we have our tactics, but... At the end of the day, a lot of success in war is really like, how do I kill a guy from as far away as possible with no danger to myself? Yeah. yeah. That's just, that's just war. There's no war in with, it. Like, so, like, I mean, like during the Vietnam War, the success was measured in how many bodies were stacked. And I'm so glad we strayed away from that because that would have been stupid. Like, yeah, we just had to do it with the Hellfire. No, you hit three dudes with the Hellfire. Um, okay. Whatever you need to make, Colonel, go for it. (laughs) Whatever gets you your promotion. Do you know what I heard yesterday? I have a friend who is uh, trained as a gunsmith, right? And he was telling me that the reason we... What's the uh, the round that's used in the AR-15? 5.56 uh, 5.56 millimeter. Yeah, yeah. yeah 5.56. Five, so the reason we switched to 5.56, five, uh, according to him, is that it doesn't just kill, it wounds. So you take uh, out one negative. guy. No? Mm, it, it tumbles is the idea. It, it seems to be about, at least there's debate on this, of course, and there's always differences whether it's armor, whether the person's fat or not. But either way, the concept of the 5.56 around is that it has a tumble, and it's just that right little peak in between where it not only hits a guy and goes through them, but hits a guy and starts corkscrewing around, doing crazy stuff, thus causing the most inter- uh, amount of inter- internal damage. So yeah. for an unarmored target, a 5.56 seems to be about that sweet spot. Okay, because like what he what he was explaining to me was like, if you hit a guy with 5.56 and don't kill him, you now have two guys pulling him out from the line of fire. Oh, that was the concept of the Bouncing Betty mine. That was for sure. Ooh, bouncing Betty was a mine that, yeah, yeah, one. when you tripped it, it actually jumped up a little bit and then detonated. And it wouldn't kill, but it would so severely maim that now multiple people have to drag that person out. Uh, mm-hmm. So, so there, uh, yeah, the concept of causing lots of injury uh, for the for more chaos and more uh, more resources to pull the guy out is uh, is as old as time, I suppose. Yeah, like just okay. Here's here's my question: What do you both think about the idea of honor in war? Because it seems like honor in war is like it's a very human thing when the actual success of war is a very robotic thing like if you you know like a ceo and a leading general have the same general have the same idea accomplish the task right but the guy on Mm -hmm. the battlefield he has more to think about than that oh yeah you uh, you want to handle it first or me Uh, oh okay i'll I'll give my perspective on honor and war okay then me really so the only honor that you're providing, I guess, for yourself is the fact that you are accomplishing the mission while mitigating the risk to the folks on the ground. But it's not like, like honor back, I guess honor back then, you know, you're on the battlefields with swords and shit and you have to bring, bring honor to your country or to whoever you're serving. I mean, there's really no honor in war. Yeah. I'll I'll be honest. Like there's really no honor in war. Like you're people, I think you're killing each other. Yeah. I think historically there's a romanticized ideal concerning honor and war. Like we think of the, uh, we think of the ancient knights and you're like, it's all about honors, all about equal, equal footing. And it's this like honorable equal footing duel that we would have. But if you actually go historically and you look at it, like knights were the kind of people that were in multi-million dollar armor that a peasant at the time couldn't until the arbalist was invented, couldn't penetrate. And you're dealing with dudes that were on up armored horses that were just running down peasants and subsistence dirt farmers. 
And you're like, okay, so we have a romantic ideal of the night and his ideal mm -hmm. set. But the reality of the situation is you're dealing with a dude who is not, who's killing people with impunity with very little risk to himself mowing down mm -hmm. poor people. Right, uh, right. I think it was the same to the samurai. Like if you actually go look at the ancient samurai, historically, you're dealing with a guy that is, again, in multi-million scale armor at the time who is just bowing down people from the back of his horse. And he had his cadre of bodyguards that was going to protect him from any foolish medieval peasant that was going to try to attack him. So I, I think historically we idealize a concept of like you, me, equal footing, let's skill and our beliefs systems uh, fight and clash in order to determine what is morally right. But mm -hmm. like factually in actuality, I feel like victory in war has always gone to the person who kills the other person with the least with the least risk in and of to himself. You jump out of a bush and you shoot a man in the back because it works. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I, uh, in the United States, we have done the same thing. We shoot. We kill people from seven miles, 10 miles in the air with multi-million billion dollar rockets and we kill people and we create little compilation videos with with the bodies hit the floor or yeah, God's shitty music. Yeah, yeah. Jump caches, God's going to cut <laughs> you down uh, of drone strikes. But and, tal and the Taliban and ISIS and all those people do the same thing with their IEDs because that's practical, because we can't come to kind of a gentleman's agreement to go stick each other with knives at equal footing. It's, mm -hmm. it's just the way it is. It's just the reality of the situation. So we have a romanticized idea of it and we have the reality of it. And the reality of it is the biggest coward with the usually, usually with the biggest budget uh, wins. I was the coward and it worked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like what you said about uh, it's like you think of it. The warrior thinks of their fight as being a fight of ideals and morals because mm -hmm. It makes it sound like these people that are really like you, like both of you that were putting your hearts into the fight. But, you know, like over time, I guess that has been more or less true for most wars is that most people think they're doing it for the good of their ideas. Right. We think we're doing it mm -hmm. to protect our country and to bring democracy to either bring or protect democracy that's what america has always done america or said they're doing sorry not done <laughs> we don't talk about the <laughs> banana republic um but uh like it it sounds like with what you said about a battle of ideals it's as if it's a lethal debate but it really isn't like that's not what war is we like to think of it that way though Yep. Yep. Warrior, you're going to try your best to undermine your enemy's strategies as much as possible. It, uh, it kind of reminds me, and I, I don't know if this is a, a little bit of a tangent, but it reminds me of, uh, when we're fighting the Taliban back in the day, we, uh, usually the army with the biggest budget wins, but in this particular case, they used so many very clever, low tech ways of defeating the ways that we'd normally mm -hmm. fight them. Like, we would, uh, they would emplace an IED with a, with say like a garage door opener. So it would be a wireless, uh, detonator on it. And as soon as they, we drove by, they would detonate it. And we're like, okay, we get clever to this. We create multi-million dollar ECM jammers, whether it's the Duke system or the Warlock system or the Thor system. And you're like, haha, now I've jammed you. You can't detonate this IED anymore. And what the Taliban did at the time was they, you would go down in a, in a convoy and you would see several children playing with RC cars and they, you just drive by and like, think not thinking anything. But what the Taliban was doing is they were determining which ID, which RC cars were actually still running because they were trying to find what bandwidth still was successful in detonating an ID. Mm. And you're like, Oh, ho, ho, smart, smart, smart. They found the bandwidth frequency that they could still use to detonate a wireless ID. Or alternatively, they would just use a wire and they're like, okay, well, how would it defeat this? Now we get ISR on it, and we uh, we can see who's laying out the ambush in advance. And then the Taliban would reply by like this cat, this constant cat and mouse game of how to. And now it's a cat uh, command wire connected to an RC device for a longer distance away from your ISR. And you're like, oh shit, uh, we're going to detonate your thing with the Rhino mount on the on the uh, yeah the MRAP. 
Yep. Well, no, yep. the chain was the flail that detonated mines, but the rhino map yeah, was yeah. that thing that stuck way out so that if it was a laser detonated IED, then mm. the, you would run into the laser way in advance and it would detonate in front of you instead of onto you. And then oh, the Talon okay. responded by okay. simply shifting the IED around. Uh, but what, what I'm trying to get to is basically that while usually a budget wins, low budget yeah. cleverness can actually kind of actually take a little bit uh, it, it's quite the force multiplier to it mm. and that you don't have to have a budget to be incredibly lethal do you think that the what you seem to be describing as you know in innovative tactical prowess of people coming up with these new ideas do you think that was organized or was it just some guy figured out mm -hmm. something and then started spreading it around like was there mm -hmm. research being done I mean, it's uh, all part of adaptation, yeah, though. I mean, it's they're they're adapting to what's being thrown at them. Like if if they notice that, oh, no matter where we're at with you know more than four people, we're getting struck. Okay, we're gonna scatter into individual, like you know, like maybe groups of two. Oh, groups of two, so many. All right, now let's break it up even further. Same thing with like the courier system, to where they're not using comms. Um, they're yeah, they're doing it to ensure their survivability from a defensive standpoint. From an offensive standpoint, they take our multi-million dollar tech in warfare and they try to use it against us. Like I know they were using like IR blankets for a while to where they were just kind of drape it over themselves and walk around and we wouldn't be able to see them at night because um, they were like, essentially the blankets were the same temperature as their surroundings. So they would just disappear right in front of us. Mm -hmm. It was almost like the invisibility cloak off Harry Potter, except <laughs> at night in the middle of a Syrian desert. I know of uh, really quickly uh, another like low tech solution that came to a high tech problem is our signals intelligence operatives would usually like try mm -hmm. to steal their SIM cards whenever we were talking to them. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, we would bring people in and like, hey, why don't we have a conversation? And we'd kind of snag their phone and on the side, somebody would try to clone their SIM card. And what they did that was incredibly clever is they put a single grain of sand where like the SIM card would be. So if they uh, if they left the meeting that we had, they would look and be like, hey, is my grain of sand still there? No, it's fallen out. They've clearly cleared Clone this drive. I'm going to go get a new phone, and you're like, and they wow. break and get a new. Yeah, yeah. Low tech solution to a high tech problem. Wow, they were clever. Mm -hmm. I it makes like, me wonder, same... like, how well do you think someone could do in a fight if they were that smart with stuff in like a dollar store? Like, how much, how much crazy <laughs> like Home Alone shit could you come up with to fight the American right. military? The jihad dollar store. <laughs> I uh, I think it's pretty funny because we have the uh, w what's the new Abrams coming out like the XMS or, or what the new M1X I think they call the new Abrams system. Yeah, and I'm, the an, Abrams I'm an air tank, guy. <laughs> Yeah, the Abrams tank X is almost like a Tesla. Like they want to make it more. They want to make it a hybrid where it takes both electric and uh, gas, and it's multiple multiple millions of dollars to get this new no, super prototype idea. in. And I'm thinking to myself, like, you know. This is still vulnerable to an EFP, yep. and an EFP, yeah, an explosively formed projectile, is still just $10 worth of copper machined mm -hmm. down into a cone and exploded with ammonium nitrate and uh, aluminum powder or aluminum nitrate and fuel oil, which is just a, which is just farmer stuff for, for pennies on the dollar. And like, you're telling me you have not learned, America, that... $500 million for an Abrams to, can still be taken down and penetrated and everything destroyed by $20 worth of machining and, <laughs> and copper. Yeah. Very clever. Well, see, when I see military tech nowadays, it's all just so beyond my even comprehension. I'm like, yeah, I mean, whatever they did, it's clearly working for them. So you'd have to, anything that you bring up on this on this stream, you're gonna have to explain. If you're talking about it working, you'll probably have to explain in some way why it's working. Okay. Oh, you want do you want to explain the EFP or? Oh yeah, go for it. Okay, uh, an explosively formed projectile. Uh, what it happens is a normal IED is your ammonium nitrate and aluminum powder, ammonium nitrate and fuel powder, it's uh, or fuel oil. It just happens to be a large explosion, and it tends to kill convoys and especially armored vehicles only if it's a very large amount of it, and it's usually the shockwave that rattles the skull cage of anybody driving those vehicles. But an EFP, 
which is an explosively formed projectile, is about piercing through and killing anybody that's 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 driving those vehicles. And what it is, if you put a disc of copper inside of a cone-like shape, you've created a shape charge, and that shape charge fires out like a sabo round, like an actual like projectile that is in a plasma. It's so hot, it's so fast, it's, it's like almost molten. in a plasma state. Yeah, it's molten. Yep. And uh, like when we were in Afghanistan, what that was one of there were two very scary things that happened. We saw IDs all the time, but we saw two uh, evolutions of the IED around the end of our time there. And the first one was magnetic IEDs, the kind that like actually clinked back to the bottom of your to the bottom of your MRAP or mine resistant ambush protected uh, transport vehicle, or it was an E. EFP and an EFP usually tended to have to, to create an EFP properly. You had to have, you have to have machines. You have to have a mill. You have to have a lathe. You have to have a lot of, uh, you have to have some skill level in creating the exact angle and the exact cone. But those were the kind of things that caused catastrophic damage. Uh, people not only were killed by the projectile of copper plasma that freaking shot through their vehicle but if anything it would create a vacuum and were sucked out halfway through it as well so your uh, your weak little fleshy body if it was not in direct contact with getting melted would uh, would just be sucked out the little hole and absolutely obliterated it was terrifying and a lot of efps if i remember correctly uh were due to iranian yeah mostly yep. iranian or pakistani uh counter intelligence forces Hmm. Where's my where's my mule? So, oh god. So and like you you bring up molten metal being the like the the damage mechanism to destroy these multi million dollar vehicles. Um, there's something similar on the air side as well. Actually, there's a few things that are similar on the air side. One is the original Hellfire missile was designed to do exactly that and punch into armored vehicles, but we instead we took these old Hellfire missiles and repurposed them with like fragmentation sleeves and essentially it was just a bunch of like scored small metal pieces that surrounded the missile so when it impacted it all broke like it, it broke up into like little i don't know like tiny fragments maybe measuring an inch or less um to uh, i mean rather than blast being the primary mechanism now you have all this fragmentation flying everywhere so it, it could affect multiple entities and not just a tank um, yeah, right. Same thing with like thermobaric weapons. Oh God! Um, which those in it in themselves are insane. So a thermobaric weapon is essentially like whenever it, it detonates, and I'm trying to describe it in like the most simplistic way I can. It superheats the air. It it essentially it takes all the oxygen out of the air. So we would use these thermobaric bombs, these 500 pounders. At the front of these ISIS caves, like near the Deazwar, Al Qaim area. And usually we didn't have anybody ever run out of the caves after we dropped a thermobaric weapon, but we had a few survivors um, that the Iraqis ended up um, interrogating. And they said that that was the most frightening weapon because they'd be sitting there, they'd feel nothing but heat because they're on the opposite end of the cave, and then they couldn't breathe. And you actually have to run out of the cave. Uh, just to get out of there. So, I mean, some pretty crazy weapons. I mean, they worked, but the the damage mechanism and how they worked is frightening. And almost yeah, and sometimes I remember because I was I was pulling some of the freaking corpses up of your work out of the out of the wreckage, and we're talking yeah. about charred bodies, and it's charred. like it's not fragmentation. It was charred. And uh, that was several of the people we pulled out. Like these people are baked. They smell mm -hmm. like burnt hair. It's terrible stuff. Yeah. yeah, and that's the that's a that's the aluminum powder that the uh, that the chemists put in your missiles because aluminum powder, when it hits uh, a certain threshold of heat, goes completely apeshit, and that's what burns around the atmosphere. Yeah, yeah, uh, ins insane weapons. I know you mentioned uh, that you eventually like ended up running into like buildings that were struck or areas that were struck. Um, have you ever actually coordinated an airstrike? Or like past like a certain grid or like general direction of compounds. Yeah, you're talking about uh, kind of fister stuff or forward observer kind of stuff. Yep, yeah. I, uh, I repaired those those stupid um, what are they called GPS systems 
And yep. so I try to relate to my my translator who was in the banana hammock, like, hey, they are over at, <laughs> let me read my little GPS device, boop, 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 uh, this, 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 this. And he would start d- doing his little Durka stuff. So I, it was like the weakest, oh. lamest diet version of the forward observer. I, uh, I remember okay. when I was in uh, the 19 Delta Cavalry Scout school, like all the stuff you're supposed to say in order to properly do an airstrike, right. like drop 50, fire, fire for yep. effect. But uh, it was way more uh, unprofessional with the, with the Kurds. Uh, and I would just give them like, hey, these are the GPS coordinates we have. I think they're there. But if you're really good with it, obviously you'd have a range finder and be like, hey, that's the actual distance for why, where I'm at. Please don't drop the, the horrible thing on me. Drop it at <laughs> this, this uh, angle and this vector <laughs> instead of mine. Yeah, he just starts I, reading uh, the yeah. coordinates on his position. I have dropped, <laughs> correct, I have dropped friggin' your craziness onto me. Or Damn. onto to the enemy. Obviously, I'm still here. So. <laughs> Imagine if like a bomber like slewed its targeting pod to like the top of a roof, and you just see some dudes chilling in a banana hammock. Like, yeah, that's him. That's ISIS. I uh, I have my buddy, hammock. my roommate, who uh, who actually like one of the things is you can't get showers when you're down range. So the only alternative is to get naked and do what's called a sun shower. <laughs> and when you can do uh, a sun shower, you just kind of rub dirt on yourself and you go chill out on the on the roof for a while. So hopefully you didn't drop any bombs on just some naked YPG people chilling out and trying to be like, oh, I just want to be clean. No, but we have <laughs> dropped munitions on dudes that were taking a poop. Oh, nice. Can a they'd man poop in the, peace? They'd be out in the middle of the desert. Like, you know, they have all their weapons and whatnot, and they're trying to, like, sneak around all the cities and whatnot. So they're, so they're not being observed. But when you see a bunch of hot spots out in the middle of a desert with no road, it's a little suspicious. And so you end up going in and like, we were like, okay, watch this guy here. He looks like the leader. Cause he's talking to everybody else. And then he starts walking out away from the camp and just out of nowhere, just drops trow and just starts taking the <laughs> media's dump in front of everyone. And I'm just like, Oh, okay. Well, this is ISIS. Um, so let's go ahead and, uh, gen up a strike. We ended up striking dudes that were pooping. So embarrassing to try to poop, we would, though, when other people poop, are watching though. you. You never know when other people are watching you downrange. I remember uh, one of the funniest <laughs> things in Afghanistan was uh, some dude was doing the Star Wars, like, d- Darth Maul kind of maneuvers at oh, the edge boy. of the base. He was at the edge of, like, Fort Bastion or one of the mini forts that we have, but he was caught by the thermals, kind of doing the Star Wars kid. Shoom, 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 shoom. And somebody fucking found him on the camera, and they copied him, and they remixed him, oh. and they started sent him with a, they, they started remixing him with the Highlander theme song. Here we yeah. are, born of the kings! As this poor uh, private who thought he was alone is now being observed by the entire Cipernet. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> we saw some of the craziest stuff through uh, through targeting pods. I remember one of them. So it was like this kid that was like running around on top of the roof, no like parental supervision, and there's like no railings on the on the sides of the roof. And the kid's just running around, probably two or three years old, just to learn how to run. And this uh, clearly an adult comes walking out out of nowhere, picks up the kid by the arm, and starts spanking the ever living shit out of this kid. And just kind of sets him down. Then the kid runs off again, like trying to avoid being spanked again. Whoops. Um, whoops. We've seen a bongo dance party where a bunch of dudes are like chilling on the outside of a bongo. Doors are open and they're all dancing and having a good time. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I think my favorite thing that we caught on the on the drones in the middle of nowhere uh, was again in Afghanistan because the majority of my time in Intel was in Afghanistan was, uh, mm. was the ISR picking up dudes who were, uh, having intimate relationships with farm animals. Yeah. Oh, people, subsistence farmers again in the middle of nowhere, very lonely. The only thing they have is their flock. They don't understand that 10, 20 miles in the sky. There is an, there is a drone, watching him have intimate relationships with his sheep with an entire operations floor watching them in the process it's like the it's like a free spot on a bingo card if you're doing like (laughs) counter isis bingo it's just like you might as well just check that off because you will see it yeah yeah. Uh, i'm gonna go to the bathroom i'll be right back one second i have drank way too much if if you have any questions just hit blinks this beer back I will <laughs> run an ad while we await his return, but I'll some say, people me, will still be here. Oh, God. Now Whoa, I have to I be can... content. Guys, I'm scared. Help. 
I have to do my own content. <laughs> you know, I'm going to read the super chats because I got Damn two it. of them. Alfarius, okay. thank you for the $20. Hey, Spigs, Zeal, and Blinksis, I hope you're having a good day. Y'all are great. Keep it up. Thank you. And thank uh, you. Phenomenal day. Yeah. And then Jack Manson, thank you for the $5. He has a question that I will ask when uh, Spigs returns. It's about, it, basically, it's, is Sun Tzu's The Art of War Required Reading? Ooh, so, God, so I'm, I'll ask that in a moment. Oh, got el agua, zero proof, very healthy. <laughs> the good shit. Oh, the good shit. Oh, Helps like the stream. Diamonds. Everybody at home, like the live stream so more people see this because this is probably the most excited I've been for a single piece of content ever. Like, I was super oh. hyped for this. And it's going super well. Like, the moment you two joined the call together, I was like, oh shit, I'm like. I, I'm losing stuff already just from being here and not live. Oh, you should have seen what we were talking about before uh, before we even hopped in voice chat. It was like we were talking about potatoes and how quickly they can go bad. And um, they'll start like sprouting arms and shit and like taking over your room if you don't eat it. Yeah, like, yeah. You have to like keep them wild. in the dark and pick the eyes off of them. Yeah. So annoying. We're like comparing him to like Groot from uh oh God, what's that movie called? Or that series Guardians called of the Galaxy. That's the one. Yeah, yeah. I am Groot. No, you're a potato. Dude, I can go for a baked potato right now. That sounds so good. <laughs> Same. Oh my I god. I can't have like any like salt or any like fatty foods or red meat right now. It's oh, because of not, the uh not the cash. Yeah, well, no, so the, well, I guess that's part of it. Yeah, so I have to take Oxy because a few days ago, or last Saturday at three in the morning, I had to go to the ER because my kidney was hurting like freaking crazy. And I, I knew it was a kidney stone, but like all my VA doctors were like, no, it's probably just lower back pain. And I ended up going to uh, the civilian hospital, the civilian ER, and they did scans, and they're like, congratulations, it's a seven millimeter stone in your left ureter. Ooh. And I'm like, oh. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. yeah. Okay. Yeah, so they were like, drugging me up. Oh, yeah, it's a good time. Okay, really quick, Ted D, thank you for the $50. You guys are awesome, oh. thank you. I uh, I guess I'm covering your drinks for the... For the uh, Got for the big stream. D money. All right. Yo. Yeah, thank you. And Give me then, some of that uh, smart water. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay. And then uh, I got a question from chat that uh, I think okay. both of you will be interested in. Uh, Sun Tzu's The Art of War. Is it yeah. an important read? Uh, you, want, you want me to take this? I'd love to take this. Okay. Uh, yeah, let me give you my short answer because mine is incredibly short. Yeah, you go. Here. I have I have not read it. All right. <laughs> well, there you go. That's easy. Uh, Sun Tzu's The Art of War, one of the difficulties I have is that it sounds incredibly wise, even though it's pretentious. I, uh, I talked to the commander of one of the YPG people, and uh, one of the problems I really had with this guy, and a lot of us had with this guy, is we were in the middle of a huge firefight, and this guy held half of his forces in reserve. Like, we saw our friends getting shot by ISIS, and we're like, all right, let's back up, let's flank, let's do this, let's help. And we were told over and over again, no, 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 don't you move, don't you do anything. And you're like, what the fuck is this? What We don't do, and we're like, we're held back, and we started getting into almost fist fights of like why we're not backing our troops up. And later after the battle is done, we go back to this commander's place, we bring up our problems with this. And he's like, have you ever read Sun Tzu's The Art of War in the most pretentious <laughs> manner possible? And he starts talking about how reserve units work. And it's like, mother effer, dude, reserves have not worked that way since like the 1600s, the 1500 medieval times. Dude, chill the F out. We need to help our comrades. You held us in reserve for a unit to back up a unit that was not coming. This is not how reserves work. And one of the difficulties about Sun Tzu is that it sounds really clever, even when it doesn't make sense in modern day context. Mm. And I, I, I've read Sun Tzu's The Art of War, and it's got this kind of fortune cookie wisdom to it that can be applied <laughs> to anything. You can read Sun Tzu's The Art of War 
uh, like how soon Sue and the art of business soon Sue in the art of painting soon Sue in the art of underwater basket weaving, because it's so generic. You can kind of apply it to everything. It's, it's mind boggling. And this guy was making very bad decisions. It tends to be mandatory for officers to read. Uh, a lot of them kind of crank one out to it every once in a while. But at the end of the day, <laughs> I would rather be under the command of a, of a teenage Starcraft player than I would a guy who's memorized the art of war. Oh God. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. The art of war is dumb. If you read the art of war, it's always like, it, it's very simplistic strategies. Like, Hey, if you're using fire, don't burn your own troops. Hey, you got cavalry. Don't <laughs> march through a swamp, idiot. Hey, you're fighting the enemy. Don't fight uphill. And w- while you're looking at the sun, and people take, but because it's described in such a very generic fortune cookie manner, people are like, oh, I'm going to apply that to my business sense. Oh, I'm going to apply it to this and that. Because they're always like, when fighting the sun, light shineth on, on the enemy, but not ourselves. And they're like, oh, well, that's very wise. I'm going to take that in a very stupid way. I hate the art of war. <laughs> it's used by very pretentious people and it gets people killed in modern day context. Do you know it what, tends you know to be for a lot of officers. You go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Well, I'm what I'm curious about is like, because it was obviously written in Chinese first, right? So like mm-hmm. what I'm wondering is the English translation, do you think that has anything to do with it? Like a poor translation or something? Or at least I a pretentious sus- translation. Yeah, I <laughs> suspect that it was very good information at the time for people that didn't understand incredibly basic tactics. But for most days, like any teenager that plays an RTS understands that larger force tends to beat smaller force. <laughs> and that like if you're a Kurdish commander in the YPG and you have units just sitting around doing nothing use them <laughs> please do not not use them because mm-hmm. that that got uh that got some of us killed and i think back of it and i'm like oh god damn fucking this guy would still be with me if this commander who had not read the art of war and had this pretentious concept of what war is and is not is yeah war. now that i think about it art of war got some of the people killed uh, now there's people that aren't with me because somebody read the art of war f that book they yeah. they misinterpreted the the concepts of that book, right? Man, that's pretty fucked up. Yeah. I, th- I think the yeah. one thing that we ended up using that's, and I, I think it's in the art of war. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it's mm-hmm. like when you attack your enemies, like use the sun to your advantage or some shit like that. And we would do that with like with aircraft. Like if we're rolling in on a target, especially if it's a strafe, you try to get the same angle of the sun to the target. So if the target is looking up, they don't see you because they're being blinded by the sun. I think that wasn't that in the art of war. Uh, yeah, well, it was, it was the, the biggest thing on the art of war that, that that corresponds to what we have is always hold the high ground. And as mm-hmm. Americans, we have the sky, so we hold <laughs> naturally the highest <laughs> ground that there is. So we that's that's one way to interpret. I mean, there are useful things in the art of war, especially when it comes to intel. Like, hey, if you have ca- if you're running counterintelligence agents, or you're running double agents, or double double agents, pay them. Because they're usually going to be very mercenary in their nature, and they're going to go for whatever yeah. the highest bidder is. Uh, don't go to war with people who have a bigger budget than you. If you do, there's certain things about guerrilla war. Uh, but again, it, it's kept so generic that it could be interpreted in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but but yeah, you know, though, here, though, because I always hear about like officers talking about the art of war, and it's like, well, I, I don't want to read it. So, I mean, yeah. like from your perspective, it's very very interesting because it's like well we were never in danger and we have air force officers that speak highly of it all the time of course because air force you know, officers are dipshits yeah oh <laughs> I, I don't mean to be mean officers but okay, ni- 95 percent from the core of my being really too. they're either extremely terrible people or they're they're like the best people you'll ever meet there's i have not yeah. seen an in between mm. yeah I uh, I guess I personally do not have luck with the officer class because uh, like one of the things that kills me the most about officers is like you have an entire class of people that are above you because they went to the University of Phoenix online and they got their English degree so now they clearly are a capable of 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 managing a group of thirty or a hundred platoon members to go live or die I mean obviously and. Uh, 
I, I, I guess, again, one of the things that kills me is the fact that, do you remember your oath of, uh, of enlistment? Do you remember, um, like, the words? Oh, the words. Oh, my God. Yeah. No, I was, when you, I was so scared that I wouldn't say something stupid. I barely remember. Right. Yeah. You you or, raise or your right hand, hand and, after and you say, yeah. I, Blinksis, or Spigs, do solemnly declare that I will defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign or domestic, oh, so help me God. Yeah. Uh, that I may, and I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and I will obey the orders of the officers intended above me. And you're like, holy crap, when I think about this, the concept of the Constitution of the United States is we are all a part of a re- representative republic, and the definition of a republic is uh, we are all equal under the law. We are all equal. Nobody gets any separate thing. There's no kings. There's no princelings. And then the second half of that sentence is, oh, also, I will obey these kings and princelings who went to the University of Phoenix online, who are clearly better than me, who clearly know more than me. And I'm like, God damn, dude, if if I crossed a bridge, would I want it made by a person who has been welding for three, 30 to 40 years of his life? Or would I want it from a person who spent five years doing or four years doing? getting a bachelor's, watching a, a PowerPoint presentation on how welding work. And yet these guys who just go online or just go to a simple get a bachelor's are now in charge of your life or death. I hate the officer class. It just kills me. It's the most un-American thing I've ever heard. Mm. Yeah. I mean, unless you're specifically like studying in something that is related to your field. Like if you're getting like an aeronautical science degree and you're going to be a pilot, that makes sense. Or like, I know like intelligence, they have like their own classes that you could take like through the Air Force. I think it's literally just called like intelligence studies. And you can get a four year, you know, you get a four year degree with that. That makes sense. Yeah. But it's still PowerPoint presentations and discussions that are esoteric, that nothing beats actually being on the ground and having life experience concerning those things. Would be a good option. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. And a lot of officers aren't. And it shows, and uh, I suppose what really kills me is like a lot of them become very pretentious because if you get a person who, and you treat a person like they're better than everybody else for say four or five years, they start to believe it. And so you get a few lieutenants, you'll get your first lieutenant, your second lieutenant, and they're like, ha ha, I get it guys. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm still learning. And by their captaincy is usually how your first four years as an officer begins. And most people Mm -hmm. leave after their first four years. They're like, okay, the military is not for me, but the kind of person that stays after four years, uh, your, your lieutenant colonels, your colonels, your generals, they're the kind of people that have been told for decades I'm better than the other people. I'm better than those people that enlisted. After all, I have a degree. After all, I have a better housing. After all, I'm I'm clearly a better person and a smarter person. You'll listen to me because I read the Sun Tzu's Art of War. And it gets bad decisions made and people killed. And it just kills yeah. me that even an officer class even exists. Because again, it's not part of a republic. That some people have a better a better time in the court of our laws. They're under a different law set. I hate it, man. I, I, I have very few officers that I respect. Acer from the uh, discord server said, but Spigs, who oh, else would make the con op slides? Oh my God. Yeah, the con op slides. You want to be take it? Slide. Was that with con ops? Just in general con ops? How about just yeah. PowerPoint in general? How do we convey information until there was a PowerPoint? You ever see oh that one in Afghanistan of like when we General Petraeus once said, "Once we understand this con up slide, we will have won the war." And it's like the spaghetti string <laughs> of Greek and rune and shit, <laughs> right? God damn, death by PowerPoint. Decrypting I, uh, the I was ancient PowerPoints. A, yeah. I was forced to be a 35 Fox or an analyst for a long time and had to make those those stupid PowerPoints. And I have three officers behind me going, make it in cornflower blue. Now yep. shift it left slightly to the right over here. Make sure and the font just is 14 be- for the title and 12 for the for the bullets. <laughs> right. <laughs> and like the most PowerPoints almost like every other day. It's ridiculous. The most minute pedantic things ever. And you're like, can you people just make better decisions that would be great <laughs> there's oh well there's something nice about being in a a field where it's not just the be your own boss thing which 
you know that that sentence has kind of been ruined by like drop shipping scammers on the internet by the way i hate that <laughs> but it, it's like when i learn something new i'm allowed to apply it like when you learn something new in the military you wait until your commanding officer has also learned that thing whether you tell him or not and then he starts applying it <laughs> The uh, what's called in the military the good idea fairy. An officer oh gets God, a, a bug up his a hole about what might be a good idea, and all of a sudden we all jump in on it, whether it's a good idea or actually not in a practical sense. Yeah, yep. yeah, it happened a lot in the targeting like community as well. Like where you like recommend certain munitions, and whatnot. And they're like, well, how about instead of choosing a smaller bomb to achieve this, what if we took a really big bomb? Threw it all the way through the building into the ground, detonated, created a cavity, and collapsed everything on top. What? That kill okay. every man, woman, and child. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, f- fuck collateral damage. Whatever, just do it. Can't, yeah. can't have a war done without a couple eggs broken. Oh my god. Mm. Is that a hospital? That looks like a very bombable target. <laughs> Said the good idea, Barry. <laughs> yeah, you... it's. Oh, you go ahead. What do you guys think about broadly the morals of the war on terror? Mm -hmm. The morals. That's a that's a tough one. You want to take it first or me? The morals on the war on terror. Well, that entirely depends on whether or not we're trying to achieve those objectives for the benefit of us as or like as the u.s or i guess as for western powers in general or if we're doing it the benefit of the folks who actually live in these air areas where the world on terror is or the 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 war on terror is occurring so i mean if you're if you're doing it like in your own interests i mean that's pretty fucked up way of doing it yeah but i mean if you're going in there to actually help people but also you know to benefit your interests as well. Like, I mean, I don't know, like morally, that's, I mean, that's such a gray area. Right. Mm-hmm. It's really tough because a lot of people, like I want to say on average, two thirds of the middle Easterners that I dealt with during my time wanted to be under the Taliban and wanted to be under ISIS. We have a lot of reports of people that would be like, Hey, I'm in the, I'm a Pashtun. I'm in the area. And I, uh, I believe in Islamic jurisprudence. This is the way I mm-hmm. want to live. And like the Taliban provides me for this thing. And the Taliban, to its credit, was very adherent to the Quran. Like they, uh, they were not, they were not the kind of people that were corrupt. Like get, to give the devil its due, they were not in it for the money. They were not in it for the political power. They gave the people what they want in the in kind of a supply and demand aspect. And you had a good portion, at least in the southeast quadrant of Afghanistan, that wanted to be under the the dictates of how they interpreted the Quran. And like they they did it well. I guess it just doesn't really sync with us as Westerners. Because a lot of us don't agree with like, hey, you can't treat women this way. You can't treat children right. this way. This is not agree with our democracy. So for us to be like, we are morally telling you that this is a bad thing is kind of a toughie, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, I, I hate the Taliban and a lot of what they, they go for, but they're not, they're not like our sort of corruption where it's all about money and political power. Their corruption lied and like humanitarian the, issues. <laughs> yeah, dude, the Taliban did the nastiest stuff. Yeah, I hear you. They uh they were throwing they were throwing acid in children's faces. They were oh, poisoning yeah. wells. Yep. Yeah, when it came to like children's places. And it's like you and I completely disagree with this, but this is the way they wanted it. Like if you're looking at it from a democratic perspective, like this is what they want. They want the Pashtun southeastern quadrant of Afghanistan wanted to live under under that way. And who are we to tell them this is no, you're wrong. This is the way you're supposed mm-hmm. to live. So you have to ask yourself where your morality is based on, doesn't it? I guess on the other side of the spectrum, too, especially with like ISIS controlled territories in Iraq and Syria, 
a lot of these civilians weren't allowed to leave either. So even if you I think my, I don't know if y'all heard that, but I think my cat just broke something. Oh, no. bad kitty. No, that sounded, that sounded like glass. Meow. Meow. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll check him in a second, but, um, <laughs> Oh yeah, he's still meowing. He's good. But the, <laughs> so like, especially in ISIS controlled areas, like, like uh, women and children wanted to leave or if like, you fell into the minority, like if you're a Christian or you, like you wanted to leave, but you couldn't leave. So at the same time, even though like those who aligned with ISIS were primarily males, some female, surprisingly, even though their ideals completely contradicted, you know, their mm-hmm. what they wanted to do in life. It do we go in and you know get rid of the problem through kinetic means? Because talking to them obviously is not going to do it. So you're. I don't know that like you have that, that is this morally correct to go in and bomb them when they are terrorizing other citizens that don't want to be there and won't let them leave. Yeah. I don't don't know. There's like, there's so many like, well, what ifs like, well, they did this, but then we did this and we can go on for hours talking about that. But yeah, it's such, that's such, that's a good question. That's a really good question. And I'm not sure any of us could really answer that because that's really Mm -hmm. complex. I I think one of the difficulties we have in the entirety of the war on terror is uh, we we have a tendency to complete the individual with the group. And you're like, when I'm when I got ISR and I got my my drone and Mm -hmm. I know the Taliban in and of itself or ISIS in and of itself are as are freaking terrible as an organization. They hurt people. They drown people in cages in in the pool. They uh, they acid attack children. They do bad oh, things. Yeah. But one of the difficulties is every missile from Lockheed Martin does not have in and of itself a fifty point questionnaire that determines whether you're deserving of death before it detonates. I mean, they have fifty <laughs> points, but it's just all fragmentation. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and it was terrible. kind of the same. Yeah, and it was the kind of same for the Taliban and ISIS when they killed us. Mm-hmm. As in, like, if if you think about the United States, we do awful things too. Like looking back on our history, we caught we were part of Abu Ghraib. We oh, yeah, torture we people. We Terrible hurt shit. people. Yeah, mm-hmm. we we bring people to CIA black sites never to be seen again. We have your fucking ADIQ infantryman that urinates on prisoners and kicks puppies off of cliffs yeah. for their TikToks. But when a when a Taliban or an ISIS person sets up an IED, they're not killing America. They're killing like Ted from Texas who is just a poor 19 year old who wanted to not be washing uh, trucks at Mr. McGillicuddy's truck depot. He wanted to to do better and to get a college education and and to do better in his life. And they also remix God's going to cut you down or Allah's going to cut right. you down in their little videos, right? So we got both sides killing individuals that may not be the same as the group. Like, I, I'm not sure every single Taliban fighter that we killed was the worst individual deserving in the world, but you just, you right. try to do your best and it's hard. It's complex. It's beyond us as people. We're all, I, I feel like we're all just trying to do our best and it's really tough when you're, when you're bringing in death to the equation because it's such a permanent solution to a mm-hmm. temporary problem. And I don't know either, man. Morality, morality is a tough one on that. Yeah. I mean, how did it... Okay, this is an intense one for both of you. And I kind of... I got, like, a feel for what the answer would be from both of you during your individual recordings. But what did taking your first life feel like? You first or me? Uh uh, I mean, I'll, I'll go first. I'll, I'll be honest. I really didn't even think anything of it. Cause it's like the, I believe that the first, like the first guy that I knowingly killed because so part of the job with like the deliberate targeting, will, targeting will, you know, designate aim points for where bombs to go. We'll see it go. We'll see the buildings explode and that's it. But you really don't get to see like, okay, were there any people in there? 
But my first actual like to where it was a dude was the guy who got obliterated by the A10. And he was so I knew his job. He was probably told to go out there and make money for the you know the ISIS cause. But in doing so, he was extorting locals for money. So in my head, I was like, okay, he's making these other people's lives really shitty. And so when he got vaporized, I didn't think anything of it. I just went, all right, moving on. Let's look for another target. Mm-hmm. Um, and it really didn't like manifest itself that you just killed a dude until after it was all done. Or it was, no, it was before it was all done, but I started realizing that I started getting enjoyment out of killing because of the the one instance at that checkpoint where I saw some really fucked up shit. As soon as that happened, I didn't care how they died. They just needed to die. And so I would actually actively go out on these hunts looking for them mm-hmm. and, you know, kill them as efficiently and quickly as I could. So I could move on to the next one and do the same. Like it became so mentally fucked up. Like once I realized like, why am I enjoying this? This is not a place I should, I should be. I that's yeah that's when everything just kind of broke down from there and you start to really think about what the hell you just did but I mean that's just from an air perspective I can only imagine uh, what Spigs here has to say I'd have to imagine like I guess the word I'm thinking of is disappointing like when you're (sighs) god damn When you're growing up in America and you don't have a whole lot of value, I guess, like, I I, I know I'm just like, I've been a vehicle of war stories from you, but you have to understand that nobody, nobody popped in 50 minerals and 15 Vespian gas into a barracks. And I just popped into existence going, I I was alive before (laughs) the army. And my, my mom was a sex worker and a heroin addict. And my stepfather was, uh, an illiterate truck mechanic and also a heroin addict. And I lived in a time and place where there was just violence was just a regular thing for, for everybody. And I joined the army in order to find some sort of value. Because I was just a face in a crowd, like a lot of us are, especially as men. We uh, we don't have an inherent value. You you hit you hit puberty, and all of a sudden you're like you're a predator. You're a you're a at, at the best you're competition, and at the worst you are a predator, and you have no inherent value. So you go into the military thinking, if I kill a person, then I'm gonna find value it was a part of yourself that was it was a part of media as you're growing up you're like you play xbox you shoot a person they die you get plus 100 points you get a big plume of light on yourself that says congratulations rank up, rank up. you're amazing a big achievement pops up in the lower right and it says you're great and your dick isn't small at all hey hey <laughs> and it's not just a just to make fun of video games but it's the same in like your movies, like your Rambo figure, your commando, your Arnold Schwarzenegger figure that kills a man and says, congratulations, you're great. You have you have justified your life. And that's been a big part of American culture that that I've been a, a part of. And I joined the army thinking like, man, I'm poor. I'm broke. I suck. But if I kill a man, one of the things is like, that's what makes you a man. You love a good woman and you kill a bad man. So I joined the army, like trying to vindicate my life or justify my life in in some scenario. And, and it was the same in the army. When you're in the army, you're not really like there, there's something called you have your, you have your pogues and you have your not pogues, your pogues, your person other than grunts. You have your Me. person that's like, yeah, <laughs> you have your person that just like clicks away on computer screens and does office biznatch work. And you have your grunts where we're, we're the person that actually does the duty and we kill people and we're cool. And we're the rest of you are just there to back the rest of us up. And I remember being a pogue 
for a long time. And I'd have mother effers walking into my office being like, yeah, I'm an alcoholic and I hit my wife, but I mean, I've killed people. So you don't really know me. You don't know what it's like. You, you I, I've killed people. That's the most important thing. And I finally killed a guy or at least I was part of a, of a chain that killed a guy. I, uh, I shot at a guy. He walked into a building. Blinks is here, lit up the building, and little pieces of him were falling down. And they're like, holy shiznat. I recognize now, at this moment, that killing people is not a big deal. It's a huge disappointment. Here was this thing that I had like led my whole life about. Like, this is what brings me justification. This is what brings me identity. This is like, no matter how, how crazy life gets, I can say that I killed a bad man and I can hang my hat on it. But now that it's actually happened, I look at this, this scenario and I'm like, I didn't really, did I make the world a better place? Really? Did this person is just gonna, his cousin's going to come try to fight in the war and his brother's going to come fight in the war and more people are going to pour into this, this circle or this cycle of death. And am I a better person when I stare into the mirror? Not really. I'm still the same lost child that just wanted to be something. And I look at the guy who was the alcoholic in the army and I'm like, man, I think this guy took a small bit of trauma and he's just using it to justify why he's a bad person, why he's an alcoholic and why he hits his wife. So killing at the end of the day was incredibly disappointing. And a lot of people just use that trauma as a justification for being bad people. Yeah. 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 Mm. What was the question again? Did I go off topic? What was your first kill like? So you nailed it. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was the, that was the um, first kill. It was uh, it was again uh, when you kill a person in today's thing, it tends to be very. Th- there's the delineation of responsibility. I'm part of a long chain of people that killed people. Like so, if I shot at a guy, he ran a building. The building blew up. Am I responsible for the guy? Am I responsible for his death? And it's like, well, partially. Blinksis might be responsible for the death. The pilot might be responsible for the death. The guy that loaded the bomb onto the plane is partially responsible for the death. The taxpayer that paid for the bomb to be loaded onto the plane to kill the guy is partially responsible for the death. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, yeah, what did it feel like? It felt like disappointing. That would be the biggest word I can say. It didn't, yeah. I, no plume of light happened, no rank up happened, no achievement popped in the right corner. And at the day, into the, at the end of the day, I'm still me. Yeah. And I don't know what I feel. I don't feel anything anymore. Like there was no value added or subtracted. It was just kind of, yeah, I'm still stuck as me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so um, another mule, <laughs> my, my follow up question is like, your, I had a really good one. Give me a moment. Give me a moment. Um. Oh. Yeah, I want to play with his ears oh. too. Uh, I can't get down there. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Oh. So that that uh that feeling of gratification. I remember now the feeling of gratification that you wanted that released that value from what you expected to come from a kill. Did it ever? come from anything else have you found it through your journey in life in some other way no you go first you see you take it first i'll take um, it sure um I have a kill. so i'm sorry repeat the last part of the question because I, I think i know how i want how i want to answer this yeah so that yeah. feeling of gratification that you needed did it come from mm-hmm. anything else throughout your journey in life yeah yeah absolutely um because similar to uh, the guy that that Spigs was talking about, like after all that occurred, like I became like an alcoholic, drank myself to sleep every night. Like it was really fucking sad. And then like just I don't know what prompted me to stop doing that. I mean, I, I snapped out of that. I even stopped like tobacco. I stopped 
being a sad little shit. And I think the one thing that it brought eventually to me in life is in my current job where I'm able to teach my shortcomings. Um, when I was a, you know, a junior analyst at the time, you know, early 20s to these new jun- junior analysts that are coming in wanting to learn the same thing. And of course, you know, a lot of them are gung ho about it. Like, yeah, we, you know, we, I can't wait till my first building gets struck and, you know, stuff like that, which I'm sure, you know, every upcoming soldier is like, yeah, I can't wait to start fucking shooting back. And he, Cause you know how gung ho all the new guys are. They're ready to, to mm-hmm. but I, I feel as though me being able to provide a little perspective for them, um, I think has added some sort of value. Um, from from this whole experience because it's like okay this is what i did wrong this is how you guys should do it right don't become so what's the word animalistic toward your goal to where you start dropping off the i guess the humanity portion of your job like put perspective in everything you do like i'm not i'm not trying to be philosophical about it or anything but being able to teach others my shortcomings and to learn from them, I think has been the one thing, one good thing that has came out of this out of, out of, I guess, killing somebody. Yeah. Yeah. How was the question? What to you? Good, sir. The, the oh, question was, good. Uh, do you feel like the gratification you desired that you thought would come from killing? Do you feel like mm-hmm. you got it anywhere else? Absolutely not. Nah, not really. Which is a shame because I spent almost a decade trying to like, trying to get to this point to kill a bad man, to hang my hat on that story of how I killed a bad man is is half of what it means to be a man, uh, in accordance with uh with a lot of American culture, and yeah, like after it was done, it's like there's there's absolutely nothing to be proud of, really. Like again, like. This was something that happened from seven miles in the air with absolute impunity where somebody else just blew him up. And it was almost like, like a technical thing, really. And the emotion therein that I would find, like, this is the justification. This is what makes me me. This is a part of my identity. Uh, now led me to just like look in a mirror and be like, well, who, who are you really? It, it, it reminds me of the movie, um, what was it, Jarhead? The first mm-hmm. movie, Jarhead, was probably the best, by far, military movie I can think of. Because you have a lot of people that are out there, and they're like, why do I even exist? I am a person who was shaped into a military weapon for a war that never exists, who is not needed anymore because the Air Force is just like bombing them indiscriminately. Why am I even here? Am I here to guard your gate? while it goes up am i here to wash the windows of the officer of the pilot that does that thing it was a movie where a lot of people just like they they wanted meaning and validation to be a warrior and technology took that from them Mm -hmm. I, i would go from village to village village punching holes in people like spider holes in people's walls and pointing my gun out in a certain direction, but nobody ever wandered in that gun's direction. And at the end of the end, they would shoot at me. And then the, the pl- multi-million dollar plane and the technology and the budget destroyed them. And I'm like, why am I, why am I even here? It was sad, man. I, I thought that killing a person would make me feel like I had value. And I, in the great chain of things, I feel just as as disposable and replaceable as as anyone else, really. Yeah, that sucked, man. I thought killing would would make me feel better, and it didn't. Hmm. Do you think that, that this, the lack of happiness that came from it maybe was an important moment of reevaluation that you now know that killing is not what you need to be happy? Definitely. Yeah. I, uh, I suppose the best way I can think of it is like being, being a pagan, being a hoplite from like the Greek era or a centurion from the Roman era who used to sacrifice 
into Mars or to uh, to Aries and saying like, this is how I find my meaning. This is how I find my identity. I am a warrior, et cetera. But at the end of the day, sex, since technology replaced that, I'm like, the only value that I can find is through, through Jeebus, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> basically. Yeah. So like, I, I have meaning and identity through the Lutheran church, but when it comes to war, I, uh, I don't think there's a lot of meaning and identity to be had in war. I think technology kind of overtook that position. And even historically, again, as we've discussed, people in the past who were knights, who were samurai, who said being a warrior is my identity and my meaning, even they were just killing peasants who couldn't really realistically fight back. Mm-hmm. And, and you're like, well, what really makes a warrior? And I'm like, well, maybe maybe being a warrior isn't a big deal. Maybe what's important is well for me, Jeebus. I don't know what uh, what other people find uh, as a as a source of meaning, affection, love, and identity. Yeah, that's a that's a word that gets used quite loosely, at least within uh, within the Air Force. Is warrior like you'll you'll have our our first shirts, which are essentially our senior enlisted leaders that act as like a conduit between officer leadership and enlisted um, that are supposed to like help the younger enlisted folks. We would have these first shirts come in and use like you, all of you guys are warriors or like you'd have like military officers saying the thing, the same thing. We are all Intel warriors. I'm just thinking to myself, that is the stupidest shit I've ever heard. Right. What is, what does warrior mean in the modern context? Yeah. It's like, dude, like we're we're looking at you know screens doing these strikes. I mean, that's doesn't really constitute us as a warrior unless we have some sort of equal footing with the enemy to where they're hitting us from a you know what I mean? Like, right? But there's no equality in war. There's a there's and yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So what what the definition of a warrior is seems to have changed over time, and we have a romanticized ideal of what that means. But yeah, the reality of the situation is. We're all trying to kill each other in the manner that renders us the safest as possible. Yeah. So I, I kind of loathe those people that create books or YouTube channels can saying, I'm part of the warrior ethos, and this is how you could be a warrior at oh, business, yeah. and this is how you can be a warrior <laughs> at cooking or warrior at whatever. And you're like, dude, you cannot you cannot use the word warrior in such a manner without diminishing its meaning. Like I know the VA has used it quite a few times, like yeah. Your like your mind is like your only enemy. You are a warrior. You did you know you did your country a service and shit like that. And you know they try to ram that down your throat. And I don't know if that's the you know a good way of doing it because not a lot of veterans feel that way. I yeah, mean right? uh, some of the some of the older like older generation and not all of them but the majority of them you know they'll be like yeah I fought for my country. I you know I sacrificed many of things. You know, for my country and my right to do this, and and I was a warrior back then. It's like my dude, you loaded ammo on F fours. Like, <laughs> come on, a little you said, uh, here. You said, yeah. like, you said that you were mm. doubting the idea of being a warrior with when you're doing everything on a screen, and yeah. you said that like it might be different if it was equal. But the question is, if these two people are basically playing chess with human pawns at this point using drones to strike the people on the ground mm-hmm. are you playing are you fighting a war or are you playing oh, a game at that I, point i guess i should i should have so let me revert that context back so what i meant like if we're on equal footing as in i'm in an operation center trying to figure out how to kill a guy in another operation center and he's in an operation trying to kill me you know what i mean yeah, not, yeah. Not like you know people in the middle and we're using them as like the overall chess pieces of war but rather like we're trying to kill each i mean that's really the only way we can be equal is if we are actively going after the dude that is doing the same job as us on the other side yeah like uh there was a book that i like a a ya novel it was like sci-fi uh back in high school that was about basically it was a post-war dystopia and it's not because it was post-war that it was dystopic uh but what happened was resources were only gathered from asteroids nowadays, right? Like all of the resources Uh, are in space in this era of humanity. Right. And so instead of killing each other on the ground, because mutually assured destruction means everybody would be gone in an instant, 
mm-hmm. uh, you know, China and Russia and then the West would literally have these like esports tournaments where their best pilots would fight each other's like they would fight each other's spaceships. Mm-hmm. And it was mm-hmm. literally it looked like a, an esports tournament as it was described. And like Ender's Game. Yeah. Is what you're referring yeah. To. Oh, yeah. that's that's what I was thinking of. Yeah. yeah. It's similar to that. Very similar. And it was what what really interested me about it was like if we continue to go in this technological direction in war, how long will we think of it as war as we realize right. that people will die faster and faster if they die at all? The concept of a warrior becomes almost um, obsolete at that case, at that point. Mm-hmm. And like the concept that you're taken from being a person and molded into what they think is a warrior and sharpened to the point of a spear's edge. And to say to yourself, like, okay, this is what I am. And then to be thrown in the closet because you're no longer as effective as the technology that's presented leaves a lot of people into exactly the kind of things which are PTSD, which comes from irreverency or irrelevancy. And you, yeah, you feel obsolete as a human being now because you've made yourself the spear. You've made yourself this, uh, this important thing. You're saying like, I am a warrior. And now warriors don't mean anything compared to drones, compared to missiles, compared to high technology. That's mm-hmm. terrifying. You have a lot of individuals out there right now, which were part of the army and the Marines who have nothing to contribute anymore, despite the fact that they sacrificed their whole thing just to be mothballed before, uh, before a war that never existed. I hear you. Like it's the same thing that happened to the auto industry is happening to death. Oh yeah. That's kind of terrifying. Slow, but assured and ever advancing automation completely nullifying educations of people who spent decades mastering a craft and when that craft is meant to be your everything like not just your work but your meaning like you said a warrior then i can't imagine yeah Yeah. Yeah. i am uh, definitely the person that's gonna have to go to the bathroom be right back sorry i'm drinking a lot of vodka yeah (laughs) i'm gonna say i'm gonna i'm gonna go check on my cat make sure you know he's still good idea good idea good, good rat shit with his friends yeah i'll be right back How's everyone in chat doing? How how's it going? Y'all enjoying? Like, have you liked the stream yet? Do a flip? I cannot do a flip. I'm sitting in a chair and like having my VR headset functional and my skull on my body and connected to it. But I uh, I hope you're being entertained even without any flips. So, you know, I'm I'm doing my best. This is definitely probably the best stream that yeah this is definitely the best stream i've done this is awesome i'm really happy with this so i hope y'all are enjoying too yeah enjoying okay i'm just getting the chat now glad to hear it yeah this is definitely going to become like an edited video too because uh i i want as many people to see this as possible i'm i'm super excited to have this shown to the world because even though you know the fucking around and having fun and talking about crazy stuff is definitely kind of the focus to start with it we've definitely talked about some really important stuff and that's really that's something i value on my channel i have some really interesting content coming up here and i am really excited to show you guys you know, the stuff that I've been preparing. I'm sorry I haven't been very active. I've been working on other projects, a lot of really big projects that I want to get out eventually. And, you know, also just kind of thinking about life and what I want out of this channel because I don't know, is this going to be my life's work? Is this going to, you know, there's a lot to think about, but I'm I'm doing my best. Uh, And I'm going to keep working as hard as I can to make stuff that you guys will enjoy. Welcome back. Hello. Well, I could not figure out what the hell that sound came from, so uh, I'm going to assume that he cleaned it up because he knew that I would uh, not give him his treats tonight. Huh. Yeah, right? Oh, God. Yeah, no idea what it was. Can you hear speaks in the background? Okay, well, I forgot the rest of that. 
the way the I said, oh, no, please. Yeah. No. And, uh, and I, <laughs> get, I appreciate that. Please keep a keep it. Yep. And, uh, last question. Uh, I'm going to go get you some. Uh, I'm going to mute him for a second so he doesn't accidentally say anything that he doesn't oh, want yeah. to have heard. And then when he comes back, I'll unmute him. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Oh, I never. Oh, wait, hold on. Spigs, I had you muted, so I didn't. Where's my other hand? In this. Okay. Oh, yep, we're back. Yeah. Oh, God. Oh, I'm like 50% vodka right now. Holy shit. Oh, God. This is medically dangerous. I'm 100% <laughs> oxy. Yeah, Oxycontin. You said you were part of the VA, and the doctor said no alcohol for you. Here, have an opioid. Oh, yeah. Am I. Or, so, seriously? Exactly. No, that's exactly what it was. So. Oh, yeah, went to the VR or VR. I went to the VR, dude. I am <laughs> fucked. So I went to the ER and they're like, "Yep, you got a kidney stones, causing blockage. Let me give you some stuff to hopefully like help you know at least jostle it around so you can you know pee again, which is awesome." And here's some like just generic medication. I'm like, all right, cool. That sounds good. Go to the VA. Mm -hmm. So you're not allowed to have like red meats. You're not allowed to have really salty foods. You're not allowed to have sugar. Um, not allowed to have alcohol, not allowed to, have, you know, like they were like listing out all this stuff mm -hmm. and they're like, however, if you have any pain and they just brought out this bottle filled with nine pills of oxy, Woo! Like, take, take these drugs. I think the best quote I ever heard was in Afghanistan, I guarded poppy fields and now <laughs> I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm guarded pot. I, I spent my life guarding poppy fields and now the VA is prescribing me nothing but opioids. <laughs> oh God. Uh, gotta love the opioids. Woo! I think Oxy, yeah, Oxy is the one that killed uh, one of my friends uh, back in therapy. Mm. Wow. So, oh, sorry, yeah, buddy. that shit, uh, that, that fucked me up for a while. I didn't know her super well, but you know, mm. like I, I knew her well enough to recognize that she wasn't there anymore. Oof. Uh, so yeah. Having a loved one that is just a skeleton of their former self is the worst. Like you almost wish you, they could die so that could, they could be at peace. But when you have like that skeletonized person that yeah. has been taking like mm. nothing but heroin or opioids, their whole life and you're like I, I can't help you i go oh, god it's terrible because it's almost a fate worse than death isn't it yeah my my grandmother is literally that. that that's what's happening to my grandmother right now she was prescribed an excessive amount of opioids and she's now basically on her deathbed because uh she got addicted and it fucked her up so bad that she can barely remember things anymore and she's like <sighs> it really she's like wispy you know there's there's not yeah. much left it, it, it's fucking terrifying so that's why the moment that you mentioned it i was like oh, are yeah, you yeah, okay yeah. with that like are you going to oh, yeah. be safe and you told me yes mm -hmm. and i believe you fully it's just like you know my my only my only interactions with oxy has been two people one has been Negative. killed and the other is close right right so, that's understandable ouch. That's like with uh, with me and alcohol, because I have a couple of family members that have passed away due to just excessive alcohol consumption. And uh, that's another reason why I just I, I quit, because it's like, mm -hmm. I don't want to go down that path. Mm -hmm. Yep. Same with the uh, the opioids. I've had multiple family members that you're just like, all you have left are zombies that are on mm -hmm. methadone trying to like taper off, but they never quite they never quite make the journey. Uh, yeah, we've got family members that are like opioids have completely destroyed their life. And between alcohol and opioids, that that's the big pandemic here in America. Yeah. yeah. Oof. Big oof. But yeah, here's yeah, what's crazy. meaning beyond those things. Otherwise, you'll, you're going to be like, subject them to them. I am so surprised. OK, I don't I don't know if this is getting into a political topic, but the legalization of marijuana. Right. Mm -hmm. I am surprised that has not gone through already like on, on, a, on a federal level i'm su i'm surprised that hasn't gone through and that's the thing so even like I, i'll bring my family up again so both my parents both my mom and my dad are anti like hard we're hardcore anti-drug folks like even if you mention marijuana it's like nope nope you're you know if you if we catch you smoking marijuana we're gonna kick you out of the house and stuff like that like, they were hard uh, mcgruff the crime dog <laughs> <laughs> scruff mcgruff and so uh, I think it was um, so somebody that that we knew near and dear um, had cancer and she elected to not do like chemo, but rather she used medicinal marijuana all the way up until like days before her death. 
and she was, you know, walking around like nothing was wrong. It, it worked wonders. And I think that completely changed my parents' perspective. But it, I mean, it's crazy how it takes a death to change someone's perspective on a particular subject. I mean, if they were that hardcore in it, how many other mm-hmm. Americans or politicians are that hardcore to not see the benefits, but rather they see the negatives uh, similar to alcohol, even though him. alcohol in my opinion would cause yeah. more issues than marijuana oh yeah both alcohol and tobacco <laughs> are significantly more harmful to society and individuals than marijuana is a lot of the reason that marijuana is still legal is kind of like echoes of racism do you know why it's called marijuana yeah yep yeah it's because they wanted Nixon. it to sound more spanish <laughs> so, marijuana. Ding, yeah. ding, 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 they ding. wanted it to sound not white so that they could make it so that it doesn't it, so it's a not white issue then we mm. turned it white mary jane that's yeah, the mary jane name I, <laughs> I can't believe that one president screwed all this up it was nixon back in the day that was Fucking all like hey let's nixon. start a drug war because hey, to attack <laughs> people that didn't vote for me hey let's uh let's get off the gold standard hey let's uh let's trade with china so we can destroy our entire middle class apparatus concerning manufacturing like one guy and if there's one guy it's richard dick nixon dude Middle name yeah, implies. I mean, he also. Hey, I'll, I'll be right back. I think someone. It's either my 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 man wife or somebody breaking in. So I'll be right back. Okay. Later. Uh, Good luck. Shoot so your like, attacker. You're a Texan. You have a Second Amendment right. There you go. Like <laughs> the uh, the thing with marijuana nowadays is like it's so blatantly obvious in statistics why it's still a. A, a not leak it, it's so blatantly obvious in statistics nowadays why it's not legal and that's mm-hmm. because the vast majority of people in prison for nonviolent drug offenses are non-white yeah it, it, yeah it's just it's it's one of those things that people act like it's a political issue when it's just the truth it was a it was a political issue back in the Nixon days when it was like the blacks don't vote for me, therefore throw them all in prison. Yep. And it's really disgusting that here we are 30, 20, 30 years later and still uh eating the ramifications of that particular act. The drug war has been an absolute failure. We should acknowledge that as such. And uh yeah. yeah. That, 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 that's terrible. One we of should my change favorite... laws accordingly. One of my favorite quotes I've ever heard was, we'd like to congratulate drugs on winning the war on drugs. <laughs> <laughs> right? I think my favorite was that there's a police department that now manufactures drugs somewhere. Like, the building got abandoned, the budget got cut, and now they make drugs there. And they're like, yep, I'd like, to think war- I think, I'd like to think drugs on winning the war on drugs. And simultaneously, as the Taliban flag flies on Kabul, I'd like to thank terror on, wor- on winning the war on terror. Yeah. <laughs> Shit. Uh, it's 20 years and trillions of dollars to replace the Taliban with the Taliban. The Taliban. The well, Taliban, more just but cooler. Taliban. <laughs> it's one of yeah. those, like, uh, it's like the yearbook meme the Taliban, the cooler Taliban. <laughs> with, the, with the glasses on. <laughs> yeah, the yeah, exactly. Yeah, it really sucks. It must really suck for the people that lost uh, sons and daughters to the war on terror in Afghanistan. To, uh, to understand that not only did the Taliban win, but the Taliban is much more justified in its position now than it was beforehand. Having, uh, having Black Hawk helicopters, having more operational capability than they did before we ever joined, but also having more justification going, hey, we're clearly the rulers here. We're the only, one who, 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 well, only ones who can yeah. keep the peace. That's, yeah. uh, that hurts, man. Ouch. That's a- the heart that was level. almost like when when ISIS captured a couple of jets and like they were actually trying to like they were taxiing mm-hmm. around and they were trying to take off. I'm like, what? we're about to fight another fucking Air Force. God damn. Yeah. Uh, when, damn. Is the, when is the last time that the Air Force had to contend with an air with a different Air Force? When was the last time? Dude, I mean, there was a there was a sh- there was a plane on plane yeah. fight like Vietnam. You talking about you talking about the latest one? Um, the it's, latest think, one was there were even okay, an the Iraqi one. Air Force in the Gulf War? Oh no. You know, you know which Air Force we went against most most recently? What's up? China. And oh, you know what we did? <laughs> we went up against China. Full on air to air, crazy ace combat seven <laughs> missiles flying everywhere. No, I'm just kidding, it was a balloon. Yeah. What the fuck <laughs> is up with that? Because I, I have not been paying attention. Mm. 
Yeah, the, but just you know, a balloon just packed full of you know Chinese. Was it over U.S. airspace? Of sort, but... Yep. Oh Montana yeah, and, and like all, all the way, way across the South US. Carolina. Yeah. Wow. I just kind of like how the administration was like, "All right, it's finished collecting on us. Now let's shoot it down." Yeah. <laughs> My favorite part of the fact that it was an F-22, one of the most high-tech oh, planes yeah. that we have, but it was firing a Sidewinder, which was made in the 1970s. <laughs> like, well, you, okay. uh, they were firing AIM-9X. This is uh, like oh. an upgraded fucking variant of the AIM-9. Like, this thing has, like, crazy off bore sight capabilities, so, like, you could have your enemy flying directly next mm-hmm. to you. The pilot can literally lock him up with his helmet-mounted display and fire the Sidewinder sideways and essentially get the kill. Like oh, these, shit. these okay. missiles are so advanced, and we use that against a balloon. A, a balloon. <laughs> hey, fuck that balloon. Yeah, that balloon. What was the excuse? Like we weren't blowing it up early because it would cause shrapnel. Is that the deal? Because it's like way, it, way, way up in the atmosphere. Is that the deal? It would cause uh, like damage on the ground. Like it could land on somebody's house. Essentially, it was what the. Yeah. Uh, You're telling me they couldn't find was, a good like patch of farmland. I have flown over the U.S. before. Don't ask questions. Don't there is literally questions. like <laughs> unloaded chunks in that bitch. Yeah. I was hoping that we would exploit it to see what kind of technology China has in accordance with spying on us. But apparently we're, we, we we're not able to pop the balloon. We just demolished the whole thing in one go. I, over the Atlantic I think Ocean. so. Yeah. I'm not entirely sure what happened to that thing. Somewhere out there, there's a bunch of counterintelligence agents that are reeling like at the possibilities. Just, just seething, just like, oh my fucking god! If I can get my hand on whatever the hell that was, you know the <laughs> FME dudes are like just ready to bust. Oh my god, we used to do that uh, again in Afghanistan. We had uh, those aerostat blimps that looked like goldfish oh, crackers. Yeah. Yeah, and we used to have the uh, the giant goldfish crackers that used to float, and they could see fifty to hundred miles in every single direction. They had like the targeting it, pod on it. Yeah, those things. Yeah, are sweet. I remember an instance in which the mooring cable had been disconnected, so it started floating out. And you're like, shit, shit, shit! <laughs> somebody get that thing! And uh, we popped it, but the the sensor array that was a part of it landed and everybody was in on it india wanted oh. it iran wanted it every, every single did. foreign intelligent agency was like go get that sensor array and it, it <laughs> the afghans got to it first and it ended up in an afghan bazaar and people were selling to the highest bidder like who could get the american sensor suite to <laughs> jesus <it. laughs> So funny story on something similar to that. So mm-hmm. when when we're flying a bunch of birds over Iraq and Syria for near constant 24-hour ops, eventually something's going to go down. There will be an engine problem. You'll maybe run out of fuel. I don't know. But we had one of the old birds, like it had an engine failure somewhere directly above Syria. And so they're like, oh, shit, let's glide this somewhere fun. So they ended up gliding it up north, trying to get it out of Syrian airspace. Well, crash before. Uh, anyone even got to it and it was still within ISIS controlled territory. So what we ended up doing is bombing the ever living shit out of our own asset that was on the ground. So nobody could exploit it before the Jawas got to it with their sand oh crawl God. from Tatooine. And, <laughs> <laughs> and they probably like strip it. They wouldn't even exploit it. They probably strip it and then like sell the metal or something. Yep. Yeah. We'd sell the copper, like a bunch of meth heads. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, has a bunch of copper. Have you seen yep. that Onion article uh, or that Onion video? You know the Onion. Oh, yeah. 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 Yep. There was a, an Onion video called, uh, like, it, what was it? Like, uh, FBI takes down richest meth war, uh, drug lord and sees $4 worth of copper. <laughs> nice. I don't know why you choose meth. Like, you have all these drugs available to you, like... I've been uh, people have described to me that being on heroin is like being wrapped in God's warmest blanket. People have described to me that being on cocaine is like seeing the face of God. People on methamphetamine, it's like, I got all the energy to rip all the copper out of the walls. If you had all these drugs available to you at about the same price, why would you choose methamphetamine? Yeah. Are they straight up like ripping the copper out of like the charging stations at some of these like Tesla stations across the US? They're probably done by meth heads. Just really hyped right. up, ready to get rich meth heads. Woo-hoo. I don't want more Push. energy. I want to not be here. <laughs> we will make dozens <laughs> off of this metal. You hear me? Practically dozens. <laughs> we will we buy shall... a dime bag or two. We shall live as kings. <laughs> <laughs> uh, shiz. Have we'll either of you... Meth- 
have either mm-hmm. of you tried psychedelics? Nope, I'm not allowed to do any sort of drugs that aren't prescribed to me. Oh, in accordance right. with uh, keeping your security clearance, right? Do you still have your security clearance? Oh, yeah. Oh, you're so lucky. Joining the YPG completely destroyed my security clearance because, like, <laughs> you spend I half a year in you spend half a year in Syria and nobody has account for you. They're like, they look at you and you're like, prove you weren't working for Osama bin Laden. You're like, God damn, I can't not prove a negative shiz. So my security clearance is gone, despite all the freaking five years worth of work uh, to keep it maintained. And so I yeah. finally, a year ago which would make me age 39, finally took my first drug. And my first drug was a chocolate bar that happened to have cybocybillin uh, mushrooms in it from like oh, Europe shit. or something like that. And uh, I felt like a little kitten wrapped in a blanket. Aww. It was great. Yeah, right? <laughs> like, oh, wow, this is what people are up to. I feel good for the first time ever. The more cybocillin drugs, please. Yeah. Now, when I... Now, when I get out and like I don't need my security clearance anymore, or if I'm just mm-hmm. like straight up retired, I would like to eventually maybe try one or two, you know, just to, not like as a like a curiosity sake, because I know the VA started experimenting with psychedelics a long time ago for like select veterans. Like there was like a very small pool that they tried it with, and apparently it was incredibly successful, especially mm-hmm. with like treating for PTSD and stuff. Nice. So I would like to try something like that just to give it a go. Yeah, just to have the experience, because everybody talks about it, and you're like, I'm going to be the Cruff McGruff crime dog (laughs) friggin' virgin when it comes to drugs for my whole life, and everyone else is having this sweet-ass party, and I'm left out. Like, I I kind of want to know what they're talking about. Did you have have D.A.R.E. in your... uh, Oh, yeah, yep, yep. Drug abuse resistant education had that one dog running around like, this is what marijuana smells like. It smells like skunk. Have you seen it's the like, Pee Wee oh, Herman ad where he holds up the little bottle no. and he says, this is crack. <laughs> no. You monster. Funny as shit. I'm about to inject <laughs> some marijuanas. Mary Juana. Oh, sorry. Mary Jane's. I'm going to inject Mary Jane's, some Mary, Mary Jane's. Jane's. <laughs> Who's Mary Jane? All right. Yeah, I think, um, uh, I, I think the experiments they've done with... Uh, psychedelics as antidepressants have shown that it is literally the most powerful and also the most harmless functional medical treatment we know of for depression for the people it works for because it doesn't work for everyone but the worst that happens is you have a shit time you don't get the kind of horrid side effects that you can get with stuff like ssris dude ssris fucking suck they, uh, what, what, what is that? What is an SSRI? Uh, SSRIs are I something, I don't remember the first word, serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And mm-hmm. they are things like Zoloft, uh, you know, the, st- the stuff you think of as an antidepressant. And right. uh, one of the major things that they do is, how do I put this? They make it harder to do the thing uh, when... <laughs> It, it, it re- oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and here's the worst part. It can be permanent. It can literally oh. damage your drive and abilities permanently. Yeah. Like, it just, like, it, it's like dulling the blade. Oh. And... That doesn't, that doesn't like, sound... Oftentimes... Isn't that just what it's like to be in the military? That was the old phrase. Like, the more you sharpen a knife, the the oh. faster the blade dulls. Being in the military oh, is the, the best concept is that you're a shooting star that's firing off that much faster or a candle that's burning that much briar ends that much faster. So Yeah. It's just Wrap like it before you tap it. It it just it really it it sounds awful to me to like be like, huh, do I choose between this thing that is important it for most people is important to ha- being in a healthy relationship or yeah. do I not want to die? You know? Like, what the mm. hell? That's, that's pretty lame. That, that's kind uh, of a gross. difficult situation to be in there. Yeah. But, uh, oh, oh, is it true that you can't be on most medications if you go into the military? Uh, I mean, I guess it depends on the type of medication. Like, if it's something for, like, 
multiple personality disorder or like any like any sort of like I don't know. Mm, man, that's that's actually a good question because I've seen waivers for pretty much everything now. Yeah, I've seen waivers for uh, heart arrhythmia. I've seen waivers for it, it depends on the needs of the military. Like when the military needs a lot of people because there's a war that's growing, they don't have enough people and they haven't recruited enough people. They will waive everything all of a sudden like oh, yeah. criminal record. No problem. Tattoo. No problem. Welcome aboard. Welcome aboard. We'll take criminals. We'll take anything. But then when it becomes more stringent and they don't need more people, they're like, you got a tattoo? Get the hell out of the army. You got you got this personality disorder? Get the hell out of the army. So yep. it's actually really gross like how fast the loyalty they have to their own soldiers kicks people to the curb. And sometimes yeah, it's like that with that. Like security clearances as well. Like if you have some sort of like mental health disorder. Like I know for the longest time, PTSD, like if you had PTSD and you had a security clearance, they would straight up rip your clearance away from you. And sometimes yeah. even, if they didn't reclass you, they would just kick you out. Oh I think God. the saddest story I remember is a signature, a signals intelligence professional who went through the entire Fort Huachuca, like six to seven month course. And they learn how to read cell phones and like I- intercept signals and all oh, that other stuff. And they're like, of- yeah, exactly. And they had a student debt. And they're like, because they became, because they were in college, because they achieved student debt, which the majority of Americans have, they were like, well, uh, foreign intelligence services may be able to exploit you because now you're poor. They were like, okay, your, your security yeah, clearance is not granted. Your security clearance is taken from you. And uh, that person, she became a medic. She had to be reclassed into a medic. And I'm like, oh my God, you trained a person as a signals intelligence operator. And you said... Oh, you're, you have student debt. Okay. We're going to have to retrain you is, uh, mm-hmm. absolutely at the very least inefficient at the very yeah, most one, you've screwed this whole person's life over. It, it's weird. It always seems to happen to signatures, but we had a signature that was going through their uh, polygraph exam so they can get like higher classified shit. And I guess they didn't take their med like their usual medication before the polygraph exam. And so a lot of these polygraph results were coming out fairly inconclusive. And so instead of saying, hey, come back another time, but be sure to take your medication as you normally would so we don't skew results, they straight up just kicked her out of the career field. Wow. It's like you're that done. Really- it lost, lost clearance and everything. Had a TS mm-hmm. or a TSSCI. Top they were secret. getting ready to have their poly. Secret and- compartment allows information. Oh. oh, yeah. Thank you for spelling these out. And no problem. <laughs> that that people TSSEI or no foreign or whatever is not a, a regular concept to people. I uh, I really hate that too because I've dealt with a lot of polygraphers. Not only when getting my security clearance, but I've mm-hmm. also personally done polygraphs on other people or the uh, the military equivalent of polygraphs, which are mm-hmm. kind of a, a lesser version. And I've dealt with those poly- polygraphers when they were in uh, the law enforcement agency when I was trying to go get a a job as a police officer. And this is what I love the most is polygraphy is bullshit. It's absolute oh, yeah. junk science. There's, there's a reason that it's not that, that it cannot be allowed as part of a court. It's equivalent to being like, it's equivalent science wise to magnet bracelets or, oh. or, uh, uh astrology that, thing that Joe Rogan always talked about. It's like that. Yeah, it's that levels of science to it. And yet people equate like, oh, you failed the polygraphy test. You must be a bad person and you were lying. You must and be hiding the, something or yeah. Yeah, right. The The polygraph test is garbage science. Uh, it's like, oh, uh, we detected in accordance with our sensors that you have higher sweat glands, that you have a higher pulse rate, that you have higher blood pressure. And but you're a Gemini, even so. people, even people that Gemini, <laughs> nice, <I'm actually> <laughs> Malibra, uh, even if you tell the truth, your sweat glands may go up, your heart rate go mu- may go up because you're like, I'm telling you the truth, but will this person believe me? And dum, 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 your blood pressure goes up. People all, all of a sudden assume you're a liar. Mm-hmm. I suppose the best science I can think against the polygraph is the fact that almost, almost 100 percent of polygraphers agree with whoever pays them money. It's that mm-hmm. subjective. Whoever hires out the polygrapher to determine truth or falsehoods is the person that gets the successful test from the polygrapher. Be very careful of polygraph tests. I hate polygraph tests. They've, they've caused me jobs before in the past. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, F the police department. <laughs> like, <laughs> as, the, as a side note. The, like, that's what... That kind of science science mm-hmm. stuff that is treated Junk as science, science but is literally astrology levels like that's 
what really pisses me off because with astrology you can just say no that's fucking stupid and most people will be like okay well either you believe it or you don't right it's it's just like have you have you fallen for it or not but when it comes to like stuff where people think it works as science it's so much harder to break it down because like you can say something is true in 10 seconds and spend the next 10 hours being slowly told why it's wrong as you throw out new things that make it sound right like misinformation is powerful like that Mm -hmm. it's incredibly subjective to the polygrapher themselves I, uh, I've heard stories of polygraph exams where the power went out in like Africa and they were like, it's just as successful even when the polygraph machine itself is not operating because <laughs> it's more about like, oh, they, they think that I'm lying and now I have to shift accordingly. It's uh, just a soul read with a fancy machine. Yeah, it's garbage. It's not allowed in a court of law for a reason and even the person that invented the polygraph exam was like yeah i tried it didn't work this actually this machine actually doesn't prove anything and yet we still have it as a a part of our society for the purposes of of security clearances or the purposes of selecting some jobs or in courts because it allows human resource people to eliminate candidates that they did not subjectively want and then they can objectively say, well, you failed your polygraph. Sorry. Could you imagine walking into an office? You're getting ready to be read into, I don't know, some crazy top secret material so you could do your job. And you see that one lady off of Harry Potter with a bowl of tea leaves. Like, you have <laughs> no clearance. And that's it. Like, you're, you're just, you're fucked. And there's the nothing AK you can do rolling. about it. Yeah. yeah. Like, what the hell? F polys. And that's a big part of our security clearance to go do to drop bombs on ISIS or to do human intelligence uh, for the war in but Afghanistan. I, I, you I get your no se- your top secret sar- secret compartmentalized information with polygraph. But the polygraph is again, yeah, you're right, the tea leaves. And you're like, really? <laughs> uh, What's funny is that since I've been in, I have yet to have a polygraph. Really? Like even with all the all the yeah, no polygraph. I literally Six months of training in tech school and, mm-hmm. and maybe a cumulative year of training in garrison or on base. Yeah. The big deal of it is it people that believe in it will tell you things that they should not have told you if they did not believe in it. So I, uh, as a human intelligence operator, operated with a CMOS machine uh, mm-hmm. and the CMOS or the PCAS machine. Uh, people would tell you things that they wouldn't tell you because they thought that like, oh no, I'm part of the magical lie detection machine, even though Mm -hmm. the machine in and of itself was, was complete and total BS. So the concept that there is a magical machine uh, relates to people telling you things they shouldn't tell you, but the actuality, like the functionality of the machine is, is complete BS. Like the machine doesn't detect anything because again, it's a very, very subjective uh, piece of technology. I've, I've heard of people failing that test for being tr- too truthful. Mm-hmm. Like, um, have you ever killed anybody? Yes. Seven people. They're all in my backyard. It's like, oh, oh, okay. Well, rewind. Yeah. Like just being overly truthful about everything. Like, I guess they have mm-hmm. to detect when you're lying to get like a baseline or something like that. Mm, but yep. I, don't, I don't, I don't know how that works. I just like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. If I have to take it, if I have to take it, it'll be interesting. I just, I don't understand. Is it because they have just had it there for a long time and they haven't removed the system that it's still a thing. I don't think they found a better alternate yet. Yeah. It's still a thing because like, let's say, you're part of a, a police department and you want to hire your cousin or you want to hire someone that like hits all the uh, she's a three foot tall lesbian Eskimo with generalized anxiety disorders. She hits all of our diversity points. We have another person who is way more qualified, but is not related to us through nepotism or is not killing these diversity points. And we want to hire. We want to not hire this person. We say, well, 
let's keep the let's keep the polygraph exam because we because we can use this subjective scientific thing to kick mm. them out and be like, well, sorry, he didn't read the tea leaves correctly. Anyway, back to our cousin who wants to work <laughs> at the police department. <laughs> That's the reason they keep it because they can keep the power while keeping the justification for removing the individual who is more uh, who is more qualified for the position. That's fucked. Yeah, How it we sucks. Even look to the topic of it of uh, polygraph. Because oh, I don't know. It was one you brought up that you had to, you had some interaction with one in. Oh yeah, yeah, my bad. Oh, I had to take okay. a polygraph to get the security clearance, right, to, right, to, to, to be military intelligence. With both of both of us are, mm -hmm. uh, for the people that are watching and don't understand, we're uh, we're both both Blinksus and I are military uh, intelligence professionals. But military intelligence is uh, is actually subcategorized. You don't go into MOS or military occupational specialty military intelligence. You go into the subcategories. And the subcategories are SIGINT, signals intelligence, which are the creepy guys that if you ever are on a phone call and you hear... That's a creepy SIGINT you're listening in on your phone call. Uh, Imenter, which likes to watch. <laughs> the creepy guy that that is is seeing all the satellite photos or the UAV photos that are like, that shadow, that shadow at that angle, that's a plane, not a mushroom. You have no idea. Signals intelligence, right there. Uh, you have your... 35 foxes, which is your intelligence analysts, which like to take uh, credit for everything all the other intelligent agents yep, do. they steal everything and make yep. it into a PowerPoint. If you watch uh, Zero Dark, the movie Zero Dark Thirty, the protagonist of that was the lady who was the 35 fox who took credit for all the hard work of the interrogators and everybody else involved. <laughs> uh, they're very good at making PowerPoint presentations. And uh, then you have your super awesome, sexy, cool guys like myself, which is human intelligence, <laughs> uh, which uh, oh, relates to <laughs> which relates to interrogations <laughs> of uh, unw uh, unwilling suspects or willing su more more ninety percent of the time willing suspects, uh, such as people that walk onto the military base and say, "Hey, I know where an IED is. I know where a bad guy is. I know this guy's related to Osama bin Laden. Let's talk. Let's flaunt." Let's uh, human in intelligence people are there for willing subjects who have a placement and access close to the information that military commanders want and are there to schmooze and be cool and smoke hookah with the locals while the imiters squint their eyes <laughs> at, uh, at, at, at little satellite photos. <laughs> okay, so his job is like, hey guys, you want to know a little secret? So this guy named John met a person named Sally who heard from her third boyfriend who's twice removed from like shit like that. <laughs> Literally rumors. He focuses on rumors. Sorry. I didn't you, you got my number. That's true. That's true. Uh, one of the funny things I, uh, I remember watching your video before I came into the channel here to like, to, to, to be on the same page. Is that a lot of your your friggin' drone bomb targeting was based on intelligence? Like it's all right, it's a very good succinct intelligence. And they were yep. like, "Oh crap, I'm the person that gave you intelligence back in the day for those bombs, and I know how terrible that intelligence was." <laughs> so I, never, if, I never said it was humans, right? If a guy walked onto a base and said. I know where the bad guys are. You'd be like, okay, let me write this and report. It would go up to a 35 Fox or intelligence analyst who would then report it to Blinksys here, who would then bomb target. And you're like, oh crap, anybody can walk onto a base and for $20 <laughs> be given like, here's 20 bucks, tell us what you know. And then Blinksys would bomb them and like, oh shit. So <laughs> maybe the Americans aren't as efficient as you think you are. Well, okay, funny thing about human. So because mm -hmm. human has that, like he said, she said, said kind of uh i don't know job description yeah we usually had to verify that human with another source of intelligence so if we had signals like if we intercepted a phone call saying oh so and so is here and then we had a hu or a human source basically saying the same thing okay well that human source is probably credible so if we decide to use them later on then you know the validity of that information may be a little bit better without getting too in the weeds here's the difficulty I did the human source <laughs> uh, verification. Humanters oh, were doing human source verification. So if they're like, 
oh, this is just some jackass that walked on well, at a base and wanted to bomb his neighbors, they would be like, hey, Spigs, why don't you do a human verification package? Okay. And I would have... I would have nice little calculations like, he's a 2 alpha, he's very trustful. He's a 6F, he's not trustful at all. And my difficulty concerning those evaluations of our human sources were like, okay, this guy walked on the base, he said there's an IED at this grid, but nobody went out to check the grid. Nobody went out to be like, verify whether something exploded wow. at that point. Therefore... Whether I label him as 2-alpha, he's the greatest, most important source of the area, or 3-f, or 6-f, he's full of, uh, he's full of shiznat. That's <laughs> completely subjective, and it was up to me. And I'm like, I have an incentivization from my command to tell you that this is a 2-a. Because if I just label every source that comes onto base as, we don't know, we don't know, we don't know, we don't know then all of a sudden I look like a guy that doesn't, that is not part of the team and is not making things kinetic. So you have a very, sub, you have a, all of a sudden a very bad incentivization for people like me to be like, he's the greatest guy ever. Go ahead and bomb it. He's the greatest guy ever. So go ahead and bomb it over and over again. And you're like, uh Oh, uh, we may have dropped bombs on the wrong people because I arbitrarily labeled things as two alpha because a lot of officers were down my gullet to tell you that this was the worst guy ever. Our source is very verified. Go bomb this guy's neighbor's house. <laughs> like, oh crap. Yeah. There, and, yeah there's and, a there's a part of the net that uh that may have gotten the wrong people killed. Well, so we, I'm glad you brought that up because we actually have probably different methods now on how we're able to verify not only like human sources, but just like sources in general in order to have a target struck. Now, if it's like third hand human report from some dude who is very untrustworthy saying, hey, there is a roaming checkpoint operating in this location and then we go there and there's a checkpoint operating there. We're not necessarily striking based off of that human one yeah that's like just one in human, a million. which is subjective i understand um which i mean if we if we actively see it there okay that's technically our second source we could see an active checkpoint here so let's go ahead and strike it but there's there's one time to we had a very very reliable source provide us grids to some isis wedding and we're like oh shit let's take a look at that let's see what's going i mean we weren't going to strike the wedding but we we're going to see kind of where everybody went and then just kind of build targets from there and the grid plotted to the middle of the desert. There was nothing out there. There's no way in hell anybody would hold a wedding out there. If they Whoops. actually managed to go out there, they'd probably die from dehydration with how far away it was. Like that dude had to go into like Google Earth or some shit and be like, mm -hmm. all right, where's the most desolate, desolate place in Iraq? And let's give that to them so they waste time. That's right. what they did. They tried to waste yeah. their time. It was great. Yeah, there were bad guys that would walk oh, on a base all the time. Not only are you looking for people that just want to provide information for money, but you're mm -hmm. you get the enemy that walks on the base and provides misinformation oh, in, yeah. in order to screw up your targeting package. I'm gonna go to the bathroom again. I'm full of a lot of vodka. Beer back. <laughs> Hell yeah. All good. Ugh. I'm filled with that vodka juice. Yummy yummy. What the hell kind of <laughs> You're seeing oh. this, right? Yeah, it's a little AFK animation. Is that really an AFK animation? Yeah. That's not what I'm seeing. What are you seeing? All twisted and shit. Oh. Huh. Weird. Yeah, the legs are crossed right here, and there's an arm here and a hand here. Huh. Weird. I don't know why it didn't show up on your end. Your shot is so weird. Mm -hmm. And the camera's so small. <laughs> yeah, big ass raccoon head just chilling in front now. <laughs> There's focus on the camera too, so it makes everything behind it blurry. Oh really? Oh shit. Okay. What if That's I went funny. here? Wait. Am I able to jump up back here? Oh shit! I'm I'm going through it. Oh. Yeah. Now you're slightly blurry because you're in the background. I have the aperture set pretty low, so it looks nicer. Um, let's see. Let me actually adjust. Why are you stomping on me? You're so mean. I wasn't stomping on you. I mean, yeah, I was. Yeah, you were. Yeah. 
Yeah. Damn. So what you got? What you got planned for the weekend? I am headed to see my parents after this. Uh, tomorrow at noon, we leave to go to the airport, and we're gonna be gone for a week. It's gonna be real nice. I'm so excited because I be get fun. to get the hell out of here for a little while with my girlfriend. Get out of the house for a little bit. That's always that's always enjoyable. Yeah. Hey, don't yawn. Hey, you cut that shit out. <laughs> you just woke up, boy. Uh, I swear to God. Yeah, it's been what, like three hours since I woke up? Yeah, three hours since I woke up. <laughs> that's it's almost dream. six. Oh, God, it it's really already getting six? dark. I hate it. I'm going to just keep my headset on and try to ignore the fact that it's getting dark in the real world and just take in the, the light <laughs> as if it was real. <laughs> Yeah, it's already dark here. I'm on the, I'm on the east coast. Uh, oh, Hello, welcome back. Welcome oh back. shiz. Hello. Hello. Oh, how would you? Oh, you're how AFK. Your oh, am I AFK? Crap. I'm uh, I'm not seeing anything, and we we're having a technical issue. Ah. Um. Okay. I will be right back then. Okay. Just click your heels three times. There you go. <laughs> Maybe one or two hail marys, and then the witch will bring you back. To your position. Oh yeah, and you do the the whole bless up thing. <laughs> do, 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 do. Be right back. I'm gonna go Alrighty. collect some props and show them off to the camera. Oh, there you go. A little, little house tour. Oh, why can't I pick? Wait, can I pick this up? Okay. Well, I have two cups. Dude, I am so go. shaky. Holy shit. Oh, I thought I would. Okay. Is there any way to like? No, they don't have physics. Oh, that's so dumb. All right. Ooh, let me do some like cup stacking. One second. Be right back. Gonna get more cups. Oh, there you go. Okay, Spigs will be back in Uno Momento. I gotta. Yeah, it's like I'm. I'm, I'm still here audio wise. Yeah, yeah. Your universe, unfortunately, VR set seems to have kicked me to the curve. Sorry, buddy. Do you know what we could do? Mm -hmm. Um, because I can tell we have. We have a lot more that we can talk about. Um, infinite quantities. We literally have infinite quantities. What we could do is we could... Uh, we just talked about intelligence stuff. We could do a part two if you wanted. And uh, it's so that we don't have a single like five hour long stream so that people like... You know, so that we have more variety mm -hmm. if you wanted. Yeah. Should, should we finish this part off with maybe a couple questions from chat? Um, yeah, whenever, I've gotten whenever that many questions from this. Wait, hold on. Let me align my head perfectly with the cups you're putting there. Let me stay perfect. You got 50 bucks in 70, 70, 70, 70 some money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we, yeah. uh, we didn't get any questions in particular. I think I got like two, but what we could do is how about this? Oh, shit. We'll call mm -hmm. this one here and then do, and then we'll go for another round. Like when I'm back from my trip. Right. Yeah. Uh, oh, Cause okay. I'm planning on kicking in really into high gear with content then so obviously everybody loved this like we got a bunch of viewers the entire time like the best i've had in months it was super fun and this is going to make an awesome video Damn. so yeah um how about this we will call it here uh and then do a part two and then like for the video version of this i can just put the two parts together okay. oh okay all yeah, right, yeah. sound good. Whatever, or, whatever or you want to do. You're the, uh, you're the, the internet deity here. I think that's the, yeah. I think the that's the plan. Boss. Okay, cool. Uh, well then we will uh talk again soon. And oh, yeah. we're we are adjourning at the moment. That is a shame. We were about to get to the head of things. <laughs> the okay. what? What? Wait, what did we you say? About to get into the, are we, we live streaming? The... Yeah, we're live streaming right now. Oh shiz! I'm sorry. I <laughs> should not have drank my body weight in vodka. Right, so <laughs> I apologize. I, I thought that people wanted me to be more drunk. Oh, that was it, it was awesome, dude. You stayed just coherent enough. Oh God. Okay. <laughs> we will. Okay, so we will have a second part of this uh, soon. Are Keep we still it, on? Yeah, we're still on. I'm just saying goodbye to okay. everybody right now. Okay. Oh, you guys want to say goodbye? Bye, friends. Appreciate you. I love. On. I love all of you. Okay. Physically. Yeah. They, oh. Okay. <laughs> take, bye. Take all the all the love.